then it turns out that that was all fake and it was like an Ashton Kutcher pranked episode where they were convincing this guy <laughs> that a plant was talking to him and telling him to infect goth kids with it. And then all the goth kids find out that like they just switched to being emo for no reason. <laughs> but I've lost the thread of this. It's a stupid as fuck episode, but like as somebody who was like in the heart and center of just like, I'm not goth, I'm emo. And it was just like that whole thing. Like, it was an episode specifically designed to like to cater to you and to make fun of you. Yes. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed it thoroughly because of that. Well, Max, it's interesting you bring that up. The the way goth kids, the way emo kids present themselves. Cause it made me wonder something. Yes. About the movie we're doing today on the Spectator Film Podcast. What? I'm Austin. I'm Max. And what movie are we doing today, Max? Atlantic Rim. Oh, I was not prepared for the joke that I was supposed to make coming out of your mouth. How dare you take my favorite movie title and use it in a joke back to me before it occurred to me to do so. You're very welcome, Austin. Well, anyway, we're doing Atlantic Rim. Um, But the question I had is, what if we had a Jaeger that was piloted by goths? (laughs) That'd be great. I'd love that. Well, sure. We're going to have a bunch of goofy themed robots. Why not? Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely, I think, and we're going to talk about this in the commentary, you know, they're themed by nation, but some of them have like personalities, specifically the Russians in a way that I think is like kind of specific, but it would be uh, terrible and hilarious to see a goth or emo. Um, Cause I don't understand the difference. Jaeger walking around punching, Punching the robot or punching other robots because they're just that moody. Honestly, they're filled with angst. There's not much of a difference. The only difference is musical. Like emo is a very clearly defined genre different than goth rock was. So that was literally the only difference. Okay. So it's just, it's nothing. But how would the robot look? Would it have ripped jeans? Would it, (laughs) would it have like, would it wear like its head would be a skull? Um, it would be cry. It would have like black tears coming down it, or like black hearts. Yeah, on it. It, yeah. You would have like a drawn like girly black hearts. You would have like a black broken heart on the chest. You would have oh, you would have like the old marching. Ba- it would look like almost look like an old black marching band uniform to reference the Black Parade by My Couple More Romance, which is oh the official album of all emo kids. Oh, uh, now we're cooking. Yes, because oh. Guillermo loves references, so yes. we could throw that one in there. So yeah, you have the marching band uniform. Um, hmm. I would I would try to go against this, but a lot of people would say that you need to have just like some sort of like red blood coming out of somewhere. Um, would you? I don't know how this is possible, but would you somehow make its weapon like it something to do with the image of it punching a mirror and looking at its reflection? I would say like you would have an empathic wave weapon where it oh. just projects sadness on the kaiju and the kaiju kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway. An interesting strategy. That would be an interesting addition to the movie to, that we're doing today, well, which Max, is actually Pacific Rim, not the most genius title that Asylum Films has ever come up with, Atlantic Rim. But oh, wait, you're telling me Pacific Rim isn't the Asylum version? No. I thought the real one was Atlantic Rim. No. Oh, Jesus. God darn it. Yeah, but we're doing yeah. this Pacific Rim, the 2013 film by... Visionary director Guillermo del Toro today about <laughs> robots f- punching giant throwing monsters. Throwing in my favorite marketing f- phrase ever, visionary director. <laughs> yes. I love that. What does it mean? Who knows? <laughs> I'm going to describe everything I do now as like done by visionary director. Yeah, so we're, we're all bullshit aside. We're doing Pacific Rim <laughs> today. Um, we brought up Atlantic Rim because it's the stupidest fucking title ever made in existence. Maybe we'll get to Atlantic Rim at some point. But no. honestly, I don't want to watch that movie because there's no way it can live up to the title. And it's too good. Asyl- it's too good for this world. Asylum movies are never like, even though that's what entirely what they market themselves on of being so bad it's good, yeah. they're never so bad it's good because when you're deliberately trying for it, it's just miserable to sit Well, through. it's just cynical. Or is that emo? I forget. We got to get off this. We got to talk about the movie. But yeah, um, you know, this was this was your pick, correct? Yes, it yes. was. Um, this is your second Del Toro pick, yeah, well, right? Del Toro is one of my favorite contemporary directors sure. by far. Um, I think it's easy to see why. As somebody who loves practical effects and makeup, Del Toro is one of the few people that continually pushes that in mainstream movies that continually make a profit. Um, 
unfortunately, this movie does not stick to that as much as I would like. Um, although there are a lot of great sets and practical effects in this movie, mainly the the suits and the cockpits, which I really love. I think the cockpit sets are some of my favorite in this movie. There's a lot of bland CGI in this. Um, but I remember when this came out, I adored this movie. I thought it was the shit. I'm just like, wow, Del Toro can take on any genre he wants and just utterly nail it out of the park. This movie did super financially well. Um, not, it did super well? Not super well, but it did yeah, well I thought enough. it did okay, yeah. Yeah, it did well enough. Well, not for two, I guess. Yeah, but that's because that... So this movie is a lot of things. And a lot of people describe this movie as, yeah, it's it's very self-aware. It knows what it is. It's a movie about giant robots punching aliens, and it's good because of that. I would disagree with that on almost every level because... A comparison I made yesterday while watching this movie is to the modern show The Orville by Seth MacFarlane. That's right. I remember this. Where that show is basically Seth MacFarlane being like, I'm a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm going to get a studio to pay me to basically... To do fanfic. Yeah, to do fanfic of Star Trek The Next Generation. Non-sexual, of course. But also, I'm Seth MacFarlane, so we have to include dick and fart jokes in there. Right. And we'll get those out of the way, and then we'll go back to my fan fiction of Star Trek The Next Generation. And for a while, I felt that's what this was for Del Toro, where he's like, right. I like kaiju movies, I like mecha anime, I like all of these things. So what if, because I'm a big enough director now, I have a studio give me millions of dollars to make my own fan fiction of that, of what I would do with that genre. And to a degree, that is what it is. But also... As a huge fan of the kaiju genre, I don't feel like Del Toro dove deep into it enough because kaiju films, as we've discussed before on this podcast, a lot of it, one, has to do with cultural scarring and giving a monster's visage to this huge problem. Right. Well, should we leave that for the episode? Yes, but I'm just going to touch on it Right, now. okay. And also it turns into mascot things. You have to be able to recognize the monsters and... They have a personality. Yes, and yeah. none of the kaiju in this have that. And as far as mecha anime, like it does touch on a lot of themes. The the ones that come to mind for me are G Gundam and Neon Genesis Evangelion because you have the fun national yeah robots, each with national traits that represent their country. And you have a psychological element where you have to psychologically connect with this robot and the burden can sometimes be too much for you and leave a lasting impact which is literally the entire plot of Neon Genesis. That's how my microwave now. works. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to, I have to drift with my microwave to yeah. get the pizza rolls. But <laughs> That's why I sound so fucked up all the time. I make tea and it fucks me over for the podcast. But it doesn't... I'm much smarter than this in it, real life. It doesn't go into either of those genres enough where I would expect... Because Guillermo del Toro does get super passionate about things. Yeah. And the movie doesn't go as deep into those things as I would like. It does a lot of great things visually, I think. Um, I think we might disagree on this a little later, but I think that's its strongest thing is visually telling us things and carrying themes through solely with visuals without too much development. On the other hand, there's only, I would say, one character in this movie that right. gets any sort of development out of that. And the other thing, it's just like, oh, right, this character has this visual thing. Yeah. Um, and also maybe expand on the characters a little more. I wish we got to know the co-pilots of the Russian and Chinese mechs, the Russians get like three lines in the movie and the Chinese people don't say a single thing the entire movie. I'm pretty sure they scream when they die, Max. Okay. Yeah. That's, <laughs> and there's, that's the most important thing but they, they say. They have the most unique, interesting looking robots and yeah, whatever. Yes, it's true. Um, so this movie didn't hold up as well, well as I remember it. Let being. me, can I interrupt you and ask you? Yes. Like, okay, I'm not going to ask you to list every Del Toro movie you've seen off the top of your head, but would you say in the ones that you have seen, which I'm not entirely sure which ones you have or have not, um, but like, is this in the middle or is it at the bottom or what would you say? It's not at the bottom. Um, but if it is at the bottom, is that necessarily a bad place? No, because like, I don't think Del Toro has ever made a bad movie per se. Maybe uh, Mimic. But again, that's a I would, specific say, case. I wouldn't you know. say contemporary Del Toro has really ever made a bad movie. Mimic was really early on Post, in his career. Yeah, it was his first Hollywood movie. Um, yeah, 
I would say this is above Mimic and Blade 2, probably. Do you think this is above Blade 2? Yes. Okay. Um, Blade 2 is fine, but maybe it just could... Yeah, it could be because I'm kind of so burnt out on superhero movies right now. Yeah, maybe. And this movie, it does have more visual flair. It is nice to see him try to bring a little bit of his artistic visual style to a big blockbuster action movie. And if I had to choose between watching this four times in a row and watching all of the Transformers movies, I would choose this every time. Right. So it, it adds a little step above of what you'd expect of a summer Hollywood robot alien punching movie, but it's not as good as I remember. And I'm kind of disappointed by that, but also it's nice to go back and revisit movies that I used to absolutely adore and get a little bit of that tinge of just like, Oh, I remember why I loved this. Yeah. I agree with that. I think, you know, um, you know, we've been doing a number of episodes now at this point, but it it is still, you know, there's so many movies. We've barely done any movies, right? Yeah. But I do think it's fun to revisit movies um, first that you might have had different opinions on or you haven't seen in a while. And I think it's discuss- it's fun to discuss movies that you feel like work in some ways and don't work in others, but because they were legitimately made as movies and not in the, in the sort of brand-controlled, you know... Um, <laughs> the the like IP based stuff yeah. where it's essentially the IP comes first and you get the movie the same way you get the lunchbox right this isn't like that it is trying to make money on as a movie it's trying to succeed financially as a movie and i think when you have a movie that's like that even if it is not perfect if it is made by somebody who cares like del toro then you're still going to have plenty of things to talk about so i'm glad we're doing this episode and i think we're going to have a lot of things to dive into um i guess i should say that i agree with a lot that you've said, even if the specifics of it might be a little bit different in how I might articulate it. I think, um, like what you were saying, I think it's very clear that Del Toro is a geek auteur yeah. type of guy. And I think that's why his movies, you know, speak to a lot of people because he's, he's an auteur who ha- very clearly explores his own interests in his work. And if you share those interests, it's a very natural um, sort of entry point into his work, you know? And obviously I think the idea to make this movie about mechs and kaiju, even though, you know, I've seen a number of kaiju movies, but I'm completely oblivious to mech stuff. Clearly it is once yeah. again, him exploring his interests. Although I'm definitely going to agree with you when I say that it is a mixed bag. And for me, it's sort of like on two different levels, it's a mixed bag. Um, I'm going to say that technically, and by technical, I don't just mean like the technical nature of what goes on in front of the camera, but I mean the technical nature of the craft, the way he knows how to set up shots and scenes. I think that is definitely hit or miss in different scenes. Uh, He is definitely a craftsman and he brings that energy to this and everything is designed beautifully and all the details are there wonderfully. Um, But I think, you know, he loses a little bit of control here because I think this is definitely as is the risk with these geek auteurs, um, he, he falls into the trap of fetishizing details and minutia in the world over the subtextual logic of the story he's telling or just the structure of the story he's telling. Like you said, there's this thing with characters where it doesn't necessarily have the strongest characters. And we're going to get into the, that more in the commentary. But I think... That is the first, that is the primary thing for me that leads to the other problems in this movie. Um, And then the second sort of phase in which I think things fall down a little bit for me is just the ideological results of making this movie, where it makes me a little bit frustrated because like we discussed in the preview screening, this, he wound up making the move, the type of movie that Starship Troopers just punched in the jaw like you yeah. know, 20 years ago. So it's like, it, it's so similar that it's striking. And yet there are so many elements in this movie that it feels like, oh God, this should have been satire. It, feels, it could have been a better version of Starship Troopers potentially. It feels like it's setting up to be satire, but yeah. then it just turns into a robot punching movie. Yeah, it's like, what could be a better satire vehicle than the idea of the military industrial complex doubling down on itself to make the most expensive weapon in the history of the universe, you know, it, there's so many opportunities throughout for, for that throughout the movie. I feel like when we do the commentary, it's going to be us almost in every scene talking about like 
this thing exists in the movie. The only thing that's missing is the, like the approach that acknowledges the humor inherent yeah. in this, you know? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of questions for me about like, you know, the, the process that went into making this because it, it feels different. But I guess the other, there are other different ideological things that sort of baffled me that made it feel like it wasn't a Del Toro movie to me. Um, and the way he approaches these monsters, the way he treats them, you know, I, I think it is Del Toro, but again, it is, it is the del, part of Del Toro that is obsessive over the details and missing the part that I feel like truly has the fundamental grip on subtext and humanity in this movie. And I feel like the latter of those two is more important if I had to choose one, because I think his strength is his, his sincerity and his ability to create emotional feeling characters, well, you know? Yeah. That's like, I hate to keep bringing up the shape of water cause I do it way too often. Right. But that movie, Doug Jones's character, the fish man, has no lines of dialogue the entire movie. Right. And is a weird fish man. But at the end of like halfway through the movie, you forget that. And you're just like, yes, love him. Be together, be together, escape this terrible, terrible cold war era, disgusting society and just live with this fish man forever. You develop emotion for the other. And that's one of his huge strengths as a director, as we've right. talked about numerous times before on the podcast. But this movie doesn't really endeavor to do that that well. And I wish it did. I still think it excels in some areas. I wish, I'm not sure if he had 100% complete control on it. I feel like, I know it's a cop out for critics to say like, oh, well, I think the studio interfered here. It feels like the studio might have been just like, no, you're making our action movie to sell as a summer blockbuster. So, Or, you know, is it a Dune situation? this is maybe comparable to Dune in the sense where when we did that movie, we, we were a little bit skeptical of the idea yeah. that it was just, Oh, he could like the studios didn't, it's like, yes, sort of, but also is it not, could you also not argue that it is them compromising the director who is the, you know, quote unquote auteur, maybe yeah. trying to make concessions to please people, you know, and then that being something that's misguided, you know, and, and something that leads them to try to follow their, their own instincts. I mean, if you do look at that, he's only made two movies since then, since Pacific Rim. But if you look at the ones he's made, he's gone, he's gone very far back in the other direction. Yeah. Whereas if you look at the ones he's made previously to Pacific Rim, what was it? He was building up bigger and bigger, right? You yeah, have the Hellboy movies, Blade 2. Um, Pan's Labyrinth yes. is, is a little bit different, right? But in terms of his English language movies, like Hellboy is obviously... In scale, you still are working with a core group of characters, but you're building towards the like production values yes. of Pacific Rim in a way that you are not if you're talking about the Devil's Backbone or Pan's Labyrinth, you know? Um, and after Pacific Rim, he is now, there's still a lot of production value there. There's still English language, you know, productions, and there's they look expensive, right? But you go back to those more personal stories. So maybe something did happen. Maybe he, maybe he changed his approach after that. I don't know. He seems satisfied with the movie he made. Um, I do think it's misguided, though, like you're saying. Yeah. But, Much like this podcast. But and you're not innocent of this. But like the podcast, we're going to go ahead. And <laughs> yes, I, ca I cannot wait. Are you ready? Yes, I think we're drift compatible, so let's go, Austin. Oh, great. Atlantic Rim. Wow, great. Yeah, I wanted to make up for not saying it earlier. And I didn't want to give you the chance to steal it from me again. Do we want to talk about during the like, opening thing of like why that's so stupid of a fucking title? But... If you don't know already why that's a stupid title, I... it's just stop listening. Okay, so the Pacific just... Rim is an action. No, 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 no. Don't you dare oh. explain. We're not going on that level. Uh, if you're going to do that, you do that on your own time. You tweet at people who listen to the show, all right? If you don't understand, you can tweet at Max, all right? That's all I'm going to say. Also, it is we, we can't just talk over this introduction. Yeah. I like this prologue. Yes. I think it's a really smart prologue. Um, oh, this is too loud. I've got to turn this off. But once we begin with the great image that begins with so many sci-fi movies, the Starfield. Yes. Of course, it's a subversion, something that does not happen no, it's as frequently throughout this movie. We we're actually get a lot of regurgitation. Yeah. Those are some 
big ass fish for being at the bottom of the ocean with that water pressure, but whatever. I mean, giant squid live at the bottom of the ocean. I'm not that. Fucking... I'm not that pedantic. Yeah. Um, yeah, they live at the bottom of the ocean because they got no bones. Yeah. But uh, I I think this this prologue is kind of formally complex in a way that is easy to to take for granted or miss because let's look at these shots right now, right? What are we getting? We're getting the voiceover about the past, right? And we're getting these shots that I think are kind of reminiscent of classic kaiju shots. It does. You know, you have the slowly breaking down the bridge. You have the ineffectual. You got the plane planes. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the way the narration progresses in this, it talks about it for as this first time event. Right. And then we go to black and we get this cut. And what is it now? It is it is a distinctly sort of late 20th century, 21st century visual collage of just 24 seven media, all different forms of, uh, images mixing together, found footage. Right. And I think it works as a progression. It's not just a progression from, you know, our understanding of these monsters. as a one-time event in the past to what it actually is now where we will learn more and more about it and they become more prevalent. It's kind of a progression from nostalgia to like current, fallen state you know yeah and i think it's interesting how smart this this entire thing is the way it introduces it where it's like we memorialized our dead and moved on what is it like it's like any number of societal issues right where we confront the one individual occurrence the one instance of it and once that's over we memorialize and we move on don't make political issue out of the kaiju max yeah you only a sick liberal would take (laughs) the kaiju attack and make it political you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, we the United. Well, we have to. We also have the conservatives' worst nightmare, where you have the United Nations pooling all their resources to form a one world military. Apparently, but. yes. Except this is also the conservative wet dream because it's now the recognition of capital as a global yeah. structure. But at at any rate, it's interesting and it's important to bring up the political edge of this because this is what it sets up, set, helps sets it up to be such a great satire. You know this. We have the opening. We, yeah, we have the fucking uh, Kaiju and Jaegers being made into Nike shoe brands. Yeah. Have- so it be you go from nostalgia right to this progression where it becomes part of the culture. And I just again, we talked about it a little bit in the intro, but it is such a fantastic way to take satire. The the Jaegers are such an amazing image of this, right? The military industrial complex which, as we'll learn later, sort of, because it's kind of tossed out dialogue, humans are responsible for them arriving here because we because of climate change, yes. right? So we are culpable for what's going on in that sense. However, at this point, it's sort of like, what is the response to these animals? Oh, we're going to double down on the military-industrial complex, and we're going to punch it. You know what I mean? We're going, it, when we're confronted with the antagonistic event, we are now doubling down on going further away from taking collective action to change society. We're just going to take the dumbest course of action and punch it. Yes. And it's a great image for that. The idea of like the most expensive thing in the world, right? But also a machine that is piloted by individuals, right? Again, not collective action. It is the individual who can make the difference. Any, it, it's Max, if you work hard enough in America, if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you, listen to Ben Shapiro, <laughs> even you, we, even you we need can to make punch it monsters. One podcast without talking about how dumb Alex Jones and Ben Shapiro is. <laughs> yeah, we do got to get away with that from that, not with it, away from. But at any rate, it's like this that's is, that's what's going on ideologically here. And I think it's important to mention that in the midst of how amazing these details are because it is easy to miss yes. that, you know? And honestly, because I feel like the intro is where we begin with a lot of this ideological depth that ultimately doesn't get utilized in a lot of different ways, um, we don't have as many opportunities to discuss where it like really engages with ideology in a way that feels super deliberate. However, we will have the entire movie to talk about how amazing the details are. Yes. Because that uh, almost goes without saying with these movies. Just as a hint for something I want to bring up later, we notice that um, early on we have his brother, when he wakes up in the bunk, it's blue colored and he sends me on the blue side and wherever uh, Riley is, it's an amber orangish shade. 
Yeah. Which are complementary. If you know, like color theory, they're complementary colors, yes. which makes sense why they're drift compatible. If you're one of those people who's aware of like stupid film student Twitter, where they tweet about, they got to stop using the orange and cyan colors. Yeah. Well, yes, they're one. It's a very popular sci-fi thing. Cause it makes things really pop. anything. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes skin tone but, contrast or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But they're, but just in general, blue and amber orange are complementary colors. Yes. So they work very well together. It tries to work that into a character yes. motif of color continuity. And he does that with a lot of characters. Yeah. He mentions that on the contract, uh, not the contract, the soundtrack as well. But so, again, so you can, it, but no, it's like, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting idea. I think it's fairly well executed. I wish they had gone more with it. Where like the characters, like we find out like Riley after like he trains with Mako for like five seconds. And even before that, he has a like, feeling that he's drift compatible with her. Right. But like they know, and you as the audience kind of instinctively knows because you're just like every character is themed around a color. And when they work well together, you're just like, oh, okay. Right. And it's an interesting concept. The movie does explore it a little more. I wish it went more with that because, as you say, for the majority of characters, it's just like, okay, that's their color. And yeah. It's going to be on screen. Well, when this they are. is the thing is like, okay, you have that continuity in there. Does it amount to anything more than? coordination and continuity in for, terms of color for one character it does for everybody else no maybe kind of yeah <laughs> like <laughs> i mean i don't know and like that's the thing it's an abundance of details fetish fetishization of the minutia but a lack of insight into it which is bizarre for del toro because i feel like he's usually one of the people who can balance that a little bit better other other comparisons maybe quinn tarantino who i think is probably the best at doing that sort of thing right now. Yeah. Um, or the most obvious guy where he's a very obvious choice, but he actually, no matter how many times he does it, he seems to still do it in such a smart way that you don't quite expect. Very intelligent filmmaker, um, despite, you know, how he might come across in certain interviews where people think he might be annoying. But he is he does make smart movies. And, um, you know, somebody else like that, uh, who I think falls into that trap more frequently than both Del Toro or Tarantino is Wes Anderson, where he just he just spends you know forty minutes looking at the board games on that shelf. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything though. <laughs> but oh, they that? all do have covers on the board game box that are different shades of pink. <laughs> so congratulations, Wes Anderson is like. It's like the McDonald's of artsy films where it's just like you go there because you know exactly <laughs> what you're going to get every single time. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's also kind of like, why am I going to go get really excited about the new movie? Because I already know what's going to happen. Yeah. And also you don't have to spend an hour and a half eating McDonald's. Yeah. It's called fast food for a reason. If I could watch somehow... Wes Anderson movies over the course of 10 minutes, I'm sure I'd enjoy all of them. I still maintain that's the only use uh, critically for cinema sins is if you don't have time to revisit an entire movie, but you just want to remember some things about it is mute cinema sins and put it on because it's the majority. <laughs> it's like, it's a shortened version of the movie, but it will get those neural pathways firing again. You know what? We need a better alternative. Cause I agree with you about that, but we just don't, we don't even want to go to cinema sins. Let's say, okay. I don't know if this exists as much, but you got to find those videos where it's like this such and such movie, but every time they say this word, it gets sped up by 10%. Yeah, but then like you have things like B movie, but every time they say B, it increases, it speed doubles and it's over in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. It's even less time than Cinema Sins. And you technically watch the whole movie. Theoretically. Yeah. Um, but here we have our first kaiju. This is probably my favorite kaiju fight yeah, I would agree. as well. Uh, I think it's also my favorite kaiju design just because it feels the most like an old school Gamera monster. Y and almost. you know what? I think those two things are not necessarily unrelated. Yeah. The way they decide to do this battle and the fact of it feeling like such a good design is like th at this point in time, the movie still has not gotten to the point where it's like regurgitating tropes at least to me, it feels like without a lot of critical awareness of, of why it's doing it. Although it's already done it once with this boat, but we'll talk yeah. about this after this fight. But I mean, this fight is beautiful. People can, for some reason, like we talked about in the preview screening, seem to ding this movie because they're like, oh, you know, they just do like, 
they just do it in the rain to make it look better on CGI. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so what? You would rather it looks worse what? and in broad daylight. And like, because there's only one, like this is dark, but God, what a great image. Unlike other fight scenes, because he has the glowy mouth and the Jaeger has the uh, orange reactor and there are only two of them. It's a very clear what's going on at yeah. every second in this fight. Um, the rain in the darkness to hide the fact that it is CGI does bite it in its ass in the second fight and especially in the underwater fight. Because yeah. the f- what it's exactly what you're talking about, though, where the formal rigor yeah. that structures this fight, the discipline required yes. to make it look something that is legible and you could tell, sort of tell what's going on falls apart a little bit more. I think it's important that you bring that up because you're right. And he actually says as much at that moment in the commentary track during that fight. He talks about how he's like, it was really important to me, even though these are all CG shots to really pick my camera placement. He did it the Pixar way where Where he's like, I'm not going to move the digital rig in a way where we couldn't get it with a helicopter, you know? And that's a great idea in terms of approaching that. But it also led him to be economical, He's like, oh, if I'm pretending I'm in a helicopter, I know I have limited time and money. So that means I'm going to also reuse shots. You know, I'm going to set up a camera angle, then I'm going to cut oh, back to it. That's a great shot, though. Just like, like the kaiju's turn into like bugs with no personality, but like that that one shot where he's like holding it and you can like see it like ferociously and like viciously trying to bite at him, like that's. Yeah. That's very well done. And this, weirdly enough, this kaiju does seem to have the most personality because it just. It's the first one we see. Yeah, it's visually has personality. It it has story significance, which the other ones really don't. Yeah. And Uh, other than one was pregnant, um, but that didn't really go anywhere. No, that didn't amount to anything, really. That's just like if they cut out that it was pregnant and they just found its brain. Yeah, that would have been fine. You think the class five one would have been like the one that they tried to imbue the most personality. Yeah. And, and we're going to talk about this more throughout the movie about the benefits of having continuity and why this is, we're going to question whether or not this is actually even a Kaiju movie because of that in terms of the continuity and, and characterization of the Kaiju in this, the well, Kaiju in quotes, maybe. Yeah. But, like, but like, I think a lot has to be said about like why this fight scene works for us compared to the other two major yeah. ones in the movie. Um, and also I think it has to do with length just as simple as that, yeah. you know? Well, it's the introduction one, so you don't want it to go on forever, but you also want to establish the stakes. You want to establish Royal A's backstory and you want to like, even though we have these amazing giant robots, it's like, no, we're not safe. Like they can kill them, but also like they're more than a match for them as well. It's not easy. Yeah. And the movie is working. Yeah. At, you know, I think it works as well as I would expect it to work at this point, you know? And it is everything you're saying where it's like, okay, we, there, because this is the first one, there's like a greater awareness of what it has to do in the structure of the movie. Whereas again, what happens later? It is, it is, if it's on a scale between the details, the world building, and the structure and the story and the characters, and those two things are on different ends of the scale at different points in the movie, the scale, the side with the world building stuff just drags all the way down, you know, and it it totally outweighs everything else. And that's not what you want in a movie that, and also that does not have strong characters. Yeah. If you're going to, if you want to go full in, in the world building, at least like we'll get to Charlie day's character later, but, um, he's a kaiju enthusiast enthusiast like that would be a good you think like yeah that would be a good time to give the kaiju personalities and like or at least just be like oh this is this type of kaiju and they do this and it was first sighted here and like okay but no they're they're big alien things that we don't know anything about and then they get blown up before instead he's just a guy that yells Okay, we'll get to them later. <laughs> Please, let's not talk about them before we have to. Yes, because uh, we I, we agree on most things in this movie. I think, for whatever reason, that's the most divisive point for and us. God damn it, I'm going to roll my sleeves up. Yeah. So better get ready. You're not walking out of this without being fucking cut. That's, like, this is a fucking set, though. This looks great. Like, it makes me wish that, like... They, this is a set? Or they just... I look like they built this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm saying, like, let's... It's a in. prop or yeah. whatever, yeah. But, like, it makes me wish that they had built, like, practical Jaegers. Not in full scale, obviously. Like, But, like, 
they built like miniatures or something like that just so that like you could get a sense that they felt real like the giant robots felt real and if you want to cut to them in cgi in the fight scenes go for it but like establish in our brains that it's not just a computer thing yeah i mean really i think that is a limit of what you can really get away with unless you're Steven Spielberg making Jurassic Park. Yeah. We're really Jurassic Park is the fundamental thing about the why that movie works is because oh they didn't make that movie with CGI in mind. Yeah. And that's why the CGI works because it is just a paint on top of what they actually thought was going to be practical effects. So it's like really the best way to do it would be to shoot it in a specific way where you have again those models every time you see it and the amount of times you see it in CGI is actually very small. Yes. You know, like deceptively small in the structure of the movie. Right. Um, but again, also this is a little bit different in the premise. And honestly, you do have to show more. If you don't want to do that with your Kaiju, which one I kind of like Kaijus are people in suits. That's like, that's a, a big thing. But if you don't, if you want to save money, that also creates a big contrast because you have the real things, the Jaegers fighting these weird CGI things. And while that may not be ideal, it also does create a visual difference. You can play with that. Yeah, difference yeah. between them. And you expect somebody like Guillermo del Toro would be, you know, a type of director who would not only be, you know, creative enough to want to play with ideas like that, but also you know, might be one of the few directors to actually find a way to negotiate with suits to try to get that done, you know, or try to make those creative decisions in a way that is also somehow satisfying a, a Hollywood sort of um, sensibility, much in the way that our Idris Elba character here has to deal with these stupid assholes on this board. Yeah. By the way, this, this is a, the first time watching the movie again for this week. This is where I started to be like, ooh, geez, because... At this point, I noticed that there are three moments we've gotten so far that are sort of cliched moments from kaiju movies that are just repetitions, and I didn't feel like changed or innovated in any way. What would, what would they inherit it from the genre? And the first one is that moment with the, the lucky dragon moment, right? Where the little shipping boat in the fucking ocean, there's usually a storm, notices the blip on their radar, and they're like, Jesus Christ, what's that? And then it's a monster, Right. So we get that moment and we see, okay, so they're here to save the boat, right? And that that is kind of more interesting because that's also what gets them destroyed. But then we get the moment where we find like the people doing the like mundane activity and then they find evidence of like the giant kaiju or in this case, the giant kaiju fight. Yeah. And in this, it just sort of happens. And then we get that scene with the boardroom stuff where it's like, you're being defunded. I mean, that happens in all sorts of fucking action. That happens in the Avengers, doesn't it? Sure. With I, Sam Jackson talking to like Powers Booth, <laughs> is sil Power Powers Booth's silhouette on a screen. But the point is like, does that change? Does that scene change anything about that cliche moment? I don't know. I don't think it does. No, and, and it, also I like, think it begins a pattern in this movie. It makes the world be like obviously like hating on bureaucrats is easy, obviously, and it's a fair target, but. Why? Like, from what we understand, like, this option isn't cheaper. They're literally just building a wall around every coastal area yeah, in yes. the world. Well, this is the, well, not the Atlantic Rim, Max, just yeah. the Pacific one. Uh, but this is this is the, the other confusing thing, right? We compared this movie to Starship Troopers, and we're going to do that throughout the rest of this commentary when things start to get a little bit more political, maybe. Um, because the movie, at this point, I feel like hasn't really committed to just being that movie that Starship Troopers is smacking down. But the, the interesting thing in comparing them is that Starship Troopers really has a good like conception of the idea of the dialectical structure between, you know, us and them. Right. And how that, how that creates drama in Hollywood sci-fi movies like this and how that is akin to propaganda in many ways. Yeah. And this movie is also very much playing with that in a very specific way that once again, just something we're going to repeat frequently, like I said in the intro, is so close to being satire already, right? What is a, this is an even better example of the dialectic because the dialectic is literally just a rock and sock and robot match, you know? It's even more consolidated than Starship Troopers. And like you had the moment, like you had 
what could have been like in Verhoeven, they would have played it up more where you have the guy just being like, well, I have good news and bad news. And you have the guy with the dog. Yeah. The bugs should burn in hell, right? Mm. After the little obviously fake dog is dead after the attack, <laughs> you know? And they even get the information in the same way. They're watching TV. Yeah. There's so many similarities. And yet this movie just does not have the awareness and the critical edge. So it just becomes the movie that Starship Troopers is attacking. But the it's still baffling because Guillermo del Toro is somebody that we, when we think of his movies, we think of how good of a grasp he has on the idea of us and them. You know, we talked about that's, this a lot in a our Hellboy theme. commentary. Yeah. yeah. He, and he, he engages with the, the mon- monstrosity, the concept of monstrosity, the monstrous other. This is a strength for him and he doesn't do it at all in this movie. And it's baffling. Yeah. Because it's like we talk about maybe he made concessions to the studio, blah, 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 right? But that's a common theme. But it's not Kaiju. incompatible with the studio movie. No. He could still do it. It's a common theme of Kaiju movies, too. Yeah. Where, like, yeah, Godzilla's terrifying and it's destroying the city, but then you're just like, oh, that's why it's doing this. And yes. Like, let's redirect it back into the ocean rather than kill it. Yeah. Let's. Like <laughs> with the Mecha Godzilla ones, it's like, oh, Godzilla's attacking us. Oh, it's because we took its relatives' bones and built a giant robot around it. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. Right. But it's always like, it's more than just the personality thing. It's like that is part of what, that's a key component in defining the difference between a kaiju movie and a movie like Them, which is about giant ants. Yeah. You know? And those are two different things. Completely. Yeah. One, you, you never feel bad for the ants in them because they're no. just villains. Because them is much more like propaganda in yeah. its in its approach to the monstrous other. Whereas again, kaiju is not just about the kaiju; it is about being introspective. Because there is always nobody is free from responsibility in the kaiju. There's a connection ship, but there's a connection between you and the kaiju. Yes. By the way, I kind of just don't like this shot. No, it's kind so of- blue. It looks Michael Bayish. Well, it's blue because he's finding his compliment here. Um, his compliment. It's to blue as fuck. Yes. Not even three colors blue is this blue. And we're introduced to Austin's favorite characters now. Um, yeah. Absolutely favorite characters. But anyway, we're also introduced to our only character in the movie. Hot take. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie Day and scientist guy are, are 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 too bad for Mako to actually be enjoyable in this introduction. Like she is not as, as good of a character as they are bad characters. Hot take. Uh, I disagree. I expect resistance. I disagree just because we'll, we'll get to them when we get to their focus scene soon. But yeah, I would agree that Mako isn't as developed as she should be. She's also the only character in this movie, unfortunately. Yeah, we got to talk about the weird arbitrary limitations that del Toro seemed to set for himself yeah, in terms of character. Because he, you, you had said in the commentary that he was very, he was just like, I need to make sports movies characters. Basically I need to make very one dimensional, one noted characters. Well, it's not even that it's like he, he doesn't even provide like a rationale for it except for like, well, I guess Kaiju movies are kind of this way as well. Yeah. Except it's like, okay. But like, you couldn't just make it smart? Like, why? But why? Yeah, why would you do it again? I think there's been one Godzilla movie where the human characters were interesting at all, and that was because they stopped them from talking and just had them fight <laughs> the entire movie. But it's like, I understand that this kaiju movie has stock characters. Yes, which is a great introduction to Austin's favorite characters in the movies, Charlie Day and Professor well, Scientist. hold on a second, because they're going to be around a fucking lot, yeah. so we can get to them. But in terms of the idea of making a movie with stock characters, you know a movie that, that we've talked about on the show that has a lot of stock characters that works very well is yeah. Island of Lost Souls. Yes. Except there's a difference between this movie and Island of Lost Souls, and the first one is that Island of Lost Souls is lean as fuck. There's no fat on that movie because you cannot have fat on a movie when characters are just pieces of cardboard moving around, right? And also the other thing is that there are pieces of cardboard moving around, but they are all orbiting a real human being named Charles yeah. Lawton <laughs> and he is entertaining as shit. And this movie does have some real, like, I don't want to insult the actors in this, but you have Idris Elba yeah, and you have Ron Perlman. Now you, 
I understand you cannot make Ron Perlman the romantic lead of this movie while he's missing an eye and wearing gold-plated boots. Um, I would love that. You would love that. We yes. know this. However, there's there's a vacuum there, you know? And Mako kind of fills it in a way. But the movie has too many other things it's juggling to truly commit to exploring her character in the way it needs to for that to actually be a, a support structure that lifts up the rest main, of the movie. She's inexplicably not our main character. We we get man. I think it's okay I know. for that, but it's like, but the rest of the movie is lacking, so now we gravitate towards the thing that is working the most. And that's Mako. Yeah. You know? And the the movie is, is structured in such a sense that like even though Mako is the most explored character, she is sort of almost contradictory. It's almost a contradiction. She is the most explored, well-established character, but she's also not explored enough to actually make the movie work well. Yeah. And the movie isn't structured in a way for her exploration to actually really mean as much in the entire plot, you know? So it nullifies what it does with her in a weird way. It's kind of confusing, but that's what happens when you make this weird arbitrary limit also i just need to point out that this is the only mo- moment in this movie that made me really goddamn mad um or I, I don't even know it just it might like my steam came out of my ears just the line where he says okay so these are the triplets from china and they they've defended hong kong port seven times yes, yes. we talked about this in the in the prep screening and i don't know if there's a real subtext here but the way it's phrased is like it's as if china is defending its own territory. And this brings us to the other really weird part about this that we should get to. I mean, China's military does defend Hong Kong. Like, that's the thing that happens. Right. But there's some weirdness in... Well, it it defends Hong Kong. Yes, it it sure... As it will defend Hong Kong soon, I'm sure. Um, (laughs) Just as we defend Japan. Um, By the way, anybody listening to us in the future... Uh, this is, uh, what day is today? Oh, it's August, uh, 2019. Just so you know what will probably happen in Hong Kong sometime soon. Um, but the thing is, is that that's a good point to talk about, like the way nationalism works and the actual choice of setting it's located in Hong Kong. Now you can say that's also part of the market that they're trying to reach, but it also, it has these weird implications too. And the other weird thing about it that we should probably talk about later because there's plenty of other things discussed when, when we get to like Pentecost's character and his backstory, but the absence of Tokyo and Japan as a nation from this is bizarre. Yeah. We have Australia as the most, like besides right. the U S mech, it's the most prominent mech in the movie. I mean, geography, it makes sense. Yes. But Kaiju invented the mech genre in, or I'm sorry. Jap- <laughs> Japan is ruled by kaiju. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, Japan invented both kaiju, yeah, kaiju and mecha. Like, right. Come on. And they're not here? They're passi- Why? They're passively referenced in like the UN meetings, and that's about it. Like, But okay, but it gets weirder with Idris Elba's backstory. But again, we should save that for later. Yeah. There's a number of things we, we haven't mentioned. That's what I'm saying. That like, have been discussed. There is. Um, my least favorite character in the movie is... I hate things, but and it, here we are. So I hate this. So Austin hates these characters because they're very over the top and one. But, but this is the great. No, it's not just that. It's like this is the perfect example. He wrote out all this stupid nonsense for no reason. What, like, what is the point of all this shit on the board? He didn't do that because he actually needed to do it. He did it because he's cartoon scientist man. Yes, and it annoys me. Exactly. I think we agree that they're because they're yeah they're both. Like, did he need to do that? No. Does his math laboratory need to be literally right next door to Charlie Day dissecting kaiju things? No. Does it have to be the fucking odd couple? No. No. It doesn't. But it's, it's not funny. It's your reaction to that that I think, like, I like these characters because I like the love-hate relationship that they have. I like Charlie Day as an actor. I like, and in these types of movies you usually do have professor scientists who's there for exposition to explain why things are about to happen. You normally do have the one who's just like, wow, I really like these monsters. I know so much about them, but it borders on like, why do you like them so much? They're terrifying and would kill you if they had the chance. 
I like them. I think both of the actors' performances are super hammy and cheesy, and I think it fits in the the type of movie this movie is trying to emulate and kind of wants to be. I can see how one you wouldn't like it just in general, those kind of characters wouldn't appeal to you. And also like they feel out of place in a Guillermo del Toro movie, but I think both actors, their performances are fine for the type of role they're playing. And it's adds a little bit of lightheartedness to a movie that could border on being bland. Cause as we've said, there's not a lot of characters to latch onto. There's not a lot of humor either. Yes. It, not even spe- like specifically satiric humor. It's just, there's not even a lot of attempts at joke so jokes. I, in fact, they have to recycle one later. I enjoy them being here. Well, I'm going to disagree with you and say that you've been wrong about every decision in your life. Of course, well, um, you say that, that to would, me every time I show up. Leave you lead you to this conclusion. You have done everything wrong. Um, first of all, why is he J.J. Abrams? What? Why is he J.J. Abrams? Why? Because he wears glasses. He is J.J. Abrams, and it annoys me. <laughs> That's not a reason. It's absolutely a fucking reason. He is, he's just aggravating. It's just aggravating. It's not funny. It's, it's just annoying. And they add nothing and we invest so much time into these annoying characters. You know what? At the very least, the scientist from the original Gojira, what does he do? He actually does something that's like, Interesting, right? He creates an oxygen bomb and he's traumatized. Yes. So he doesn't jump around like a fucking nerd idiot with his mystery box JJ Abram glasses. He just sits there and he Austin, I think your introspective judgment is clouded by the fact that it just gave you flashbacks to JJ Abrams. So you know, you're Max, judging you're Max, judging Charlie Day for the sins of JJ Abrams, which I don't think is fair analysis. No, I'm I'm judging all of it. Max, I don't think you you, you oh, get look. to so Ma- you don't get to walk away. We're gonna have this argument again. I'm just saying the yeah. movie's gonna come back to them. I'm not gonna let you get out of this. But interestingly enough, we're back to the blue and orange coded, um, blue as fuck. Yes, and this is the first time Mako is being featured prominently, and we already know that Riley's char- character is color coded for the amber orange. So. We've only ever seen the blue when his brother was now around. Mixing, so yeah. Now the now that the blue is black, yeah, back. It's interesting. This is like a Wes Anderson thing to do. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I think that like when you do this and nothing else, it is Wes Anderson. Yeah. You know. I, I wish they had gone more with it. I wish the character like when he's really when Guillermo del Toro is like, oh, we took the specific shades of blue and analyzed the exact color values to create dye for her hair, so they were the same. It's like. But why? You could spend 20 minutes on this. How about you spend 20 minutes and come up with a second joke for the fight scene so you don't have giant robots knock into a small thing within yeah. five minutes of each other? I can come up with a different joke. It won't be funny, but it'll be different. And that'll be refreshing in a 25-minute fight scene. Or at the very least, I'll have something weird. I'll just throw in something random there. I'll have the, the, the robot punch through the building and then you'll see people having an affair in an office room or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) But one other thing to mention that we did not really uh, discuss earlier when we talked about the, um, the Jaegers and how they work as images as, as sort of like a consolidated image of like the military industrial complex is the other interesting thing about this movie, which is the drift, which I think, I think you and I both agree that in some ways it is, a concept full of potential in this movie that goes kind of unexplored because of what the movie needs to juggle in terms of its characters that it has to sacrifice they could that have done a little bit. So much more with it. Yes. And, um, you know, we'll talk about the specifics of that a little bit later on, but I think the interesting thing about the way in which drifting works in this movie is that it's described as memories in everything and like your past that allows you to sort of meld with this machine, which is this image, right? of the, of your society. It is the status quo. It's the machine. It's, it it is the system that you're melding with. Right. But in a way that is like you are giving over to identification with your society. Right. And that's a very powerful thing. If you're going to make a movie that's satirical and about kind of like propaganda, right. It's because you, it's how do you become, you know, melded with 
with like just the status quo in your mind. Like it's the inability to disavow and face Here's the, like okay, so I just your like, own system. Yeah, I had an idea, like because we're talking about how oh, Guillermo del Toro talks about humanizing the other a lot. Yes. And it's very hard to do that with a kai like if we're gonna take the approach he does to kaiju this way. Um there are two ways I would have wanted to take this. One don't have the one world government UN funding everything idea. Right. Instead, have each country responsible for creating their own Jaegers. And each country is convinced that the other ones are the reason that the Jaeger program is failing. Have Mako be from Japan or something like that. And their last Jaeger was destroyed or whatnot. So there's tension between like America and Japan. And then when you drift... You, they learn each other's sides and they alleviate that. You literally have the joining of the minds yes. and understanding of culture. Or throw in Charlie Bray, yeah, explore Charlie Day's idea of drifting with a kaiju brain and figure out what the fuck right. they want and find come to some kind of synthesis that way. And and this is, of course, the real reason, more so than just why I find them annoying that those characters are, are they don't work for me. And that's because, like so many things in this movie, they have the corollary in Starship Troopers. And Starship Troopers gets it right with Neil Patrick Harris. And that's a stealth good performance from him, I think, where it's like... I wouldn't even say stealth. I think it's, <laughs> I think well, it's a good performance Well, I mean, he general. disappears throughout the movie, but it's yeah. like, you do real... It's not just his, like, SS Hugo Boss, like, outfit, right? It's like, he, he he's, a, he's a serial killer, psychologically. He sees people as objects, you know? And he's manipulative, and he is the, he is the mind, that is driving this invasion. And of course he has no problem sending these grunts to their deaths by the million or whatever. Yeah. They invade this planet for no reason, just because he wants to know how they respond. And we get the same exact narrative arc in this movie with the brain bug. It's the same thing. And uh, the difference between, you know, what, what they do in Starship Troopers and in this movie and what Del Toro usually does is that for him, it's rarely ever just a bug, you know, yeah. the Kaiju in the giant seed monster in Hellboy 2 is everything that these kaiju are not for me. That kaiju, when that kaiju dies, you are stabbed in the heart a yeah. little bit because it's this beautiful animal, this is right? The, this is the last of its kind and you're going to kill it. Because and it's a precious thing, yeah. yeah. And and it makes you have this more complicated, you know, relationship with the villain because you know that he he is not innocent also. He's exploiting it, you know? And he's exploiting... Hellboy's otherness by trying to rely on his solidarity with this creature, but Hellboy is still tied to the human world and has to defend it, so he still feels torn about this. So it's a torturous experience for almost everyone involved, the characters as well, right? And in this, there is there is no torture aside from Mako's backstory, which is just vengeance. Yeah. And Idris Elba, Elba you know, he, he reads back the, the platitudes about vengeance to her, you know, the dumb Yoda lines. But, like... Does vengeance the, leads to hate. Hate leads to the kaiju dark side. Like, but does that actually amount to anything in the movie? No. Actually, her finding vengeance actually makes them a better pilot. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, the only thing it really does Him is... Him trying to stop her from vengeance actually fucks things over and like makes it in, harder. Y- yeah. Them. her Him forcing her to repress her trauma in that specific way in order to move on and and allowing her to progress through repression and not confronting her past is what actually makes her vulnerable to being like, you know, having that awful, you know, traumatic flashback while she's drifting, right? So really, it I don't even in my mind relate that to the idea of vengeance. That doesn't happen because she wants vengeance. That happens because she was traumatized. Yeah. Those two things are not the same. So it's like... I can't even remember my fucking point and bring this up. It's all just to say that like the kaiju in this are not, not really kaiju. They're just bugs. And when we get the scientists who are trying to understand them, it's, it is purely through that dialectical progression where it's like, okay, we, we were once bested by the antagonists, but now we understand them in order to destroy the bug. You must think like Like a a bug. bug. Yes. And yes, it is. It is very reminiscent of, of Nazis. It's exactly what the fuck, uh, 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 Hans Christian Andersen. Um, <laughs> oh, what is what is the actor's name? I how am I forgetting this beautiful man's name? I, I know what Hans you're Landa. Talking. It's from Inglorious Bastards. Christoph Waltz. Yes, thank you. you. What are the great lines from that amazing opening scene? 
I have to think of where it would occur for a rat to hide. You yeah. know, it's ex- it's all the same rhetoric. Well, yeah, I think like well, hyper nationalist, hyper militarized things are always going to sound like Nazis because that's the epitome of it. But the but, uh, but the real problem is that you he treats the kaiju like bugs. They yeah. could be a militaristic society, but then it would be confrontational, at least to, to some extent, if they were sentient somehow. You know. Yeah, like. And if we're going to establish the kaiju as not just mindless monsters, but as like these bioengineered things by another society, have like a pilot be a, like a sleeper agent or a secret thing from that. And then like, yeah, they learn it's like, oh, well, no, this planet's not worth destroying. Humanity can work right. together. But there's no emotional engagement. Yeah. With them. Yeah. They're just weird alien things. It like- has arrived at a conclusion about them yeah. before it, before we ever even watch the movie, you know? And it, I think it goes back a uh, one way in which I think is is that's exemplified really well is in that scene where they're watching it burst through the wall, right? I think it's very much the sort of thing where even though we don't know it at the time, he does go far enough to give Charlie Day the few lines where he talks about our responsibility in creating the circumstances for them a lot to arrive. Like also, we are partially responsible. For also, and that change. line has the dumbest line in the movie, which implies the dinosaurs were created by them. We'll get but. to that. <laughs> um, but. Like, so we, we understand that there's a little bit of a uh, responsibility that we have to that extent, right? Even if it's not truly explored, really, the way most kaiju do, most kaiju movies explore it. But the thing that's interesting about that scene is like, it's not that when it breaks through the wall, nothing about it indicates like the need to reflect on why the wall is there and why we're responding it to it that way. Instead, the fact that it broke through the wall is emotionally used to validate the fact that, oh, we shouldn't build a wall we have to punch it. Yeah. The fact that it broke through our wall doesn't make us question the need for a wall and the thing's monstrosity. It just validates its monstrosity. It's like, it's not just a monster. It's more dangerous than our walls are capable of stopping. So we have to go punch it. He's going to take the yellow pill. I'm not sure what shitty corner of Reddit that is. Um, It'd be funny if the twist on this was just that it was like Viagra. <laughs> If I don't put the blood in my dick, it leaks out my nose. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. <laughs> oh, my God. My dick is so big that it holds so much blood that it just overflows <laughs> out of all my orifices if I don't have a boner all the time. Well, I mean, Idris Elba probably does have an enormous dick. Look at the man. He's gorgeous. But Okay, so now we have Charlie Day <laughs> building. Austin, listen. I, I can... <laughs> I, I'm... I'm I am there with you on less graphic terms because this is a family podcast. Is it since <laughs> when the fuck did that happen? Um, we're not uploading to YouTube. We don't need to worry about algorithms. iTunes. This isn't explicit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think iTunes is either going to bother mark us. But he's going to drift with a kaiju brain and not even think about the very obvious thing that Ron Perlman will bring up later. It's like, but drifting is a two-way thing. That's the whole point. It's supposed to alleviate stress off one brain. So why wouldn't they also be able to see into yours? And if you didn't account for that, how the fuck did you build this thing without accounting for that? Like, oh, well, I like... And how does he know that you can drift? This is the problem with this movie not exploring drift stuff as well. Like, it could work as that really good metaphor, like we're saying, where it's like this idea of emotional investment in your society that makes you susceptible to manipulation by that society. You are emotionally, and, and like, in terms of your identification, you have become melded with this society, right? And this is something we talked about in the prep screen. This is why it's like certain conservatives are, like, utterly, like, unable to deal with reality because they have no ability to lift a mirror to themselves. They are too drifted with American society, right? So they are, they are lost to it, you know? And, um, it's like that works as an image and that makes the, the Jaeger kind of like a complex representation of how these people identify with the complex that is sending them out to destroy these animals. But it's also like, when you don't explore it, you do open yourselves up to like different questions, you know? And when the movie doesn't, doesn't have like a really unifying, like secondary logic in terms of its images. And it's actually like focused on exploring that it, it just gives you time to be like, well, now I'm, I'm feeling the urge to pick apart the holes in this because it doesn't feel like it's doing anything with it, you know? And there are things you could do with it. 
Okay, but we have Idris Elba giving her the shoe. That is that will... a Red Shoes reference? The only reason I ask is because obviously Del Toro references a ton of different things. But the Red Shoes, I, I always... mentioned Hans Christian Andersen, <laughs> right? Story about a girl who puts on, the, she's a dancer, she puts on the shoes that she sees, the Red Shoes, and they're kind of magical, and she's really happy at first, but then she can't take them off and she can't stop dancing, and she eventually dances herself to death. Yeah. It's maybe comparable to this. We talked over the fight scene they had with one another. And, uh, you know, one thing Del Toro talks about in the commentary track is how he tried to choreograph that as a dance sequence, you know, um, and not a straight up fight. Right. Yeah. And I think that makes sense for that scene in those characters. And uh, maybe maybe the red shoe makes sense. Maybe it's a reference to the Tom Hanks ma- movie, The Man with the One Red Shoe. I was thinking it was more of a <laughs> just a simplistic reading of Wizard of Oz type thing. Where oh, that too. Dorothy, that you're too. not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> that too as well. Yeah. And she's... Certainly this is a movie that has the possibility to open up avenues where you're going through fantastical yeah. sequences, which so, we're going to get right here. It's good timing to bring that up. Yes. Um, and this line is also interesting because I remember after this movie came out, people almost agreed with Idris Elba's character in this where like Mako fucked it up initially. And like, how did she, uh, like, how, how did she make it to, by the end of the fight that she's already an expert Jaeger pilot? Where it's like, Mako's not the one who fucks up in this scene. Right. And that is something that he also points out. And yeah. I, that, I agree that that's very important. Where yeah. it's like, if you are going to tell, if you are committed to telling the story of two characters having to work together within this robot, like, yeah. it, and you are going to have this down moment in the story where there's a challenge, right? And this is a good opportunity to, because the drift is something that's very much fundamentally connected to who you are as a person, more so, more so than some like materialistic, like physical activity you have to do. It has to do with character. This, uh, the drift cuts right to the heart of your character. So if you fail to drift in a specific way, it has to do with who you are as a person and it works in a story. Yes. So it's a great opportunity for, for that, like you're saying. And, um, you know, if you are committed to telling that story, it does have to be a shared responsibility when things go wrong. And as we're going to see, like, oh, this is the dinosaur moment. Oh, God. Okay. Did you say what it was already? The dinosaur thing? Okay, yeah, where the dinosaurs were the first attempt by them. She turned me into a newt. <laughs> but that character's called Newt. That's this why is also that. like Charlie Day did, did, like disobeyed orders immensely and like put everybody in danger and including himself. Also, he talks about how the the kaiju brain is very valuable seeming. So why mm-hmm. would he just use one with no? idea of how it would work. I feel like that's such a valuable commodity. I would be like, but what if I need this for something else? The yeah. survival of humanity could depend on my ability to have access to a kaiju brain, potentially for some other reason, right? If I'm the leading kaiju expert in the world, so I'm going to use it all up. It was the dinosaurs. <laughs> God, that's so stupid. The dinosaurs were created by aliens to conquer Earth. The kaiju are not dinosaurs. People make this mistake often enough, Max. I was a paleontologist at age three, Oh, yes. And I will have you know. I've read your papers. They leave a lot to be desired. They have excellent drawings. Your your stegosaurus having both eyes and a smile on one side of the head leaves a lot. They (laughs) never smiled. They took their job seriously. Uh, Dinosaurs are not the same as aquatic reptiles or avian reptiles. And I believe it has to do with the hip bone. Okay, Are you going to tell me that knife head has the dinosaur hip bone? It's not the same. No, I don't. But Jeff, but fucking Ron Perlman does. Because he needs to show up in the movie because they're not giving me funding for Hellboy 3. Darn it. And yeah, this is the time in the movie where, like we do with every one of Del Toro's movies, where I get to complain that, yeah, Del Toro didn't get to make Hellboy 3, even though he had to script and was really wanted to make the movie. Yeah, with Lobster Jones and uh, Bruce Campbell as that character. Lobster I don't Johnson. Know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I like. I don't know anything about him, but that'd be fun. Lobster. I'd love to see him be a lobster. Well, because like in the comics, Lobster Johnson is like this. He he's a comic book character in the comics where he's like almost Captain America, where it's just like. Come on, boys, we need to go fight the Nazis. Right. But then you find out that, like, no, he was an actual soldier named Lobster Johnson who went and killed Nazis. And 
and he went nuts. Not really, but like he ran into paranormal shit that he wasn't expecting Did fighting he get Nazis. Lobster claws. <laughs> Oh, but that, how do you end up with the nickname lobster and how can I make that happen for myself? <laughs> Just happen, have to happen naturally, you know? Oh uh, yeah. See, we get also, cause uh, he's the one that causes them to fly out of alignment. Charlie Hunnam's yeah. brother's name is Yancey. Yes. I, I just, I don't know. It's, uh, Okay, thanks for that. Anyway, but Raleigh isn't doesn't seem super American to me, and neither does Yancey. That's interesting. But anyway, <laughs> can we <laughs> get back to my point? Yes. Where it's like, oh, well, we pull Mako because Mako, she can't control her emotions. Yes. She's falling back into she, this like, trauma. She, like, gets slingshotted yes, by... Yes, but Raleigh's the one who caused that because yeah. he looked over her and was just like, oh, fuck, my brother died. He's only the one that can stabilize. Yes. Yeah. He's the one who flew her into the, her psychological trauma. And and this is, again, and, and I, this is a great time to pivot into, you know, different possibilities for what you could do with these drift sequences because it gives you this this rare opportunity in storytelling to have on the sa- in the same simultaneous moment something that matches with, like, a surreal, internal, totally, like, dream logic, surreal sequence that's going on with the character and their emotions and their backstory while having it in the same moment, having real world consequences. Yeah. It's speaking of lobster. Yeah. And, and my, my complaint with, with the drift stuff in this as a missed opportunity is similar to feelings I have for something like inception. Okay. But you know, can I talk about, cause I keep bringing up color theory. This is the most important sequence in the movie for it. Right. Um, blue and yes. So the, We've already coded Mako as blue. Um, as you can see, it's the color that she's wearing. That exact shade is also the exact, as Del Toro said in the commentary, the exact shade that they used for the dye. Yes. Which is a wonderful vis- visual representation that the movie does not draw attention to at all, that she has never let go of this day in particular. This has shaped who she is as a character it's literally right by her head. Like it's still in her brain consistently. I, I guess the difference is that I don't find that impressive it's and I just see it as Wes Anderson. I think it's the only time that the color coding really plays into the story though. And I think it's noteworthy because the color coding is so vital in this. Like this is the only time it directly impacts a character. I like it. Does it make up for the lack of characterization of everything else? No, but it's interesting and it sticks out in a movie where I wish they would have do- where done where the details more are, stuff are like, almost purely fetishized. Yes, and without I meaning, yeah. and I would have liked them to do more stuff like this because I do think this works. You might not. You know, uh, like, yeah, it does work. It, it it is visual structure. Yeah, but like, I'll put a penny in the red letter media jar. But like the first time you saw this movie, you might not have noticed that, but your brain did. Like, right. It it's a good way to like show your character's psychological state. You could have even cut this thing short, but like But also like if we're going to pivot into psychological states, like if we're I I understand there are restrictions on budget and everything or whatever, but could we have conceived of the movie in the way to take advantage of the surreal potential of the drift to do that more? You could have. But I think that would be a completely different movie. Um I, Right though. That's the thing. Like Yeah. Like I said, but is that more interesting? One of the major influences for like the psych controlled robot thing is Neon Genesis Evangelion. And that entire show is literally just like, why are we subjecting teenagers to terrible psychological torment in order to pilot these robots? Um, and I think that did it really, really well. Well, um, do you, th- do, is it part of it then that you, cause we came up with some decent ideas that you yeah. said were maybe similar to that just talking on her own that you're like, Oh, that, that actually is similar to this anime. But like, do you think part of it is feeling a need to differentiate this movie from that? Um, well, one neon Genesis Evangelion, the threat is like really weird and vague and surreal to a degree. And that's not going to be in your summer blockbuster movie, (sighs) I Um, guess, but it is just more interesting. I guess you would, you accept. I, my thing is like, you are Guillermo del Toro. I feel like you can accept the creative challenge of, also taking it in that direction, but trying to make it somehow different. But that doesn't mean you make it less interesting by not exploring it. No. You know? Like, and listen, th- when how, whatever company is going to buy the American movie rights to Neon Genesis Evangelion, because I know it's going to happen eventually, um, 
if you could let Del Toro direct it, that'd be great. Because I think that if he doesn't feel the need to differentiate himself from pre-established things, he might be able to do something fun and interesting right. with that. Well, but, at the very least, I'm sure he'll write a first draft with some interesting ideas and then that get will get canceled. changed completely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Akira movie was just like put on delay for the 18th time. So like it's never going to happen. But but yeah, I, I guess part of the some of the ideas we were having in reference to that were like, if we're talking about, again, and comparing it to the the ways in which Inception is a little bit lackluster is like you have this space where you could do anything and you can, it, the limits are your own creativity in terms of how you conceptualize character and the characters are able to work through conflict in this dream space. You can do anything like, and also the fact that they have to access the dream state through this weird meditative, like reflection and in, introspection, you know, and they have to then combine that with action. That's a very interesting thing. You can, you can, really explore not just the way it looks and what happens in this world and the logic of it, but you can also explore the, like the ramifications of being the type of person who has to meditate in that way in order to act, you know, does do the Australia, does the Australian brash guy really seem like the type of person who's capable of the same introspection required to drift in a way that like, no. And especially since his own father thinks he's a piece of shit and like, doesn't but really they're go- in each other's mind. So they know yeah. that, right? Yeah. So it's weird. We didn't even talk about it too. Like, does that cause a, like a causality loop almost where it's just like, <laughs> I think my son's an asshole and my son can read my mind and knows he thinks I'm an asshole. So he's going to continue to act out and it just, but it's like it, you, because it is not explored in either way, yeah. it kind of becomes inconsistent. And we were even, by the way, talking of fetishized details, why are we referencing Chinatown with this? I mean, cause the black market kaiju thing is like deliberately meant to look like, yeah, Chinatown. Just in general. What? No, I don't mean that. I mean the knife in the nose. I know, but I'm saying like you might as well reference a movie with the same name. But um, um, but yeah, we get Ron Perlman, who but, but, is you know, a like, fun, colorful character. He's a breath of air. Yes, for me. But like, it is that thing where it's like there's so many questions. Like the we didn't even talk about like the whole thing we talked about yesterday with the the Russian pilots and how they look totally like sexed up in a weird way. Like we, t- we have discussed in the past how Guillermo del Toro seems to like have an awareness of rule 34 and like work that into his movies yeah. in a specific way. And I'm like, he definitely sexed up this Russian couple <laughs> and somehow it looks like they're just wearing speedos underneath well, their I remember, armor. I remember when the movie came out, like they were fan favorites by far. Yeah. Cause like, people want to fuck them because yeah. they got dyed hair that matches with their like contrasting brown, like eyebrows and yeah. beard. I mean, yes, they're sexy as fuck. They also have like... <laughs> the most visually distinct Jaeger out of all of them. Like they're the most visually interesting. Characters. But the other thing we talk about with the drift is like, so wait, do they like mind fuck each other? Well, Whether because they know they're you a know? couple. So yeah. Could they do that? Yes. And also is we, drifting technology available for fucking. I need to know this. It's important. <laughs> right. But also like Mako was checking out Charlie Hunnam and before tr- she gets in the thing, Charlie Hunnam's like, you look good. Yeah. You like a, well, you I look think pretty like, hot right now. It's a, it implies that like it's supposed to because you're connecting with this person on such a deep level that like. But then it doesn't. They have to be family. You have to basically be family or lovers. Like that seems to be the thing. Or triplets or whatever. Yeah. But also, there's a certain amount of like social tension that comes with that. And I understand that this is not cer- necessarily the type of movie it wants to make. But also, when you make the movie about Mako's inability to overcome her trauma. To do that, it's like, how is that also compatible with this idiot who has no ability for introspection whatsoever? You know? And it also is incompatible with the potential of the image. I know this movie is not trying to be a satire, but it is totally incompatible with the possibility of that image being something where it's like what we're talking about with the way conservatives are unable to separate their own identity from like identification with nationalism. You know? They are unable to separate they are too, they drift too much with the robot there inside, you know, like they are too much dependent and invested upon identification with this country. So like, but that requires a lack of introspection and personal worth in a certain sense to be able to do that and be your own person and hold like a community you're part of accountable. You have to be your own person and you have to have introspection to a certain extent to do that. So what is it? Which one is it? I don't know. I really don't. But 
And then just some other things, you know, where you get more cliche scenes. We just talked over it, but that whole fight between Australian boy and Charlie Hunnam, we talked about this yesterday. It's like you start out with them insulting him and it's like, oh, he's a dick. We get it. But you you just get the same cliche scene where the girl gets insulted and the boy has to fight for her honor. Yeah. But like, wouldn't it be more interesting if he never insulted Mako and Mako just punched him? Yeah. Like as we've seen, Mako can fight better than Ron. <laughs> But also, Mako, everything makes more sense for it to be Mako. She's already emotionally raw because she just yeah. fucked up on a big scale and almost killed everybody around her. Yes. Right? And she probably, because there's such a direct connection between what the Jaegers do and their pilots, they say it, Jaegers are only as good as their pilots, right? Um, like, she will feel responsible for that. And it, she's about to get dismissed from the whole thing by Idris Elba, right? She just did, yes. And yeah. So it would make f- more sense for her to dig herself in a deeper hole by by using her her fists instead of her words, Max. Yeah. Like, and I honestly just like that little acting moment. Like, this movie doesn't have a lot of great acting, but like, she was really trying there. Like, I genuinely buy that she's heartbroken and like. Tr- right using 100% of her strength. Well, the weird thing is together. that like, that's the only scene in the movie where she's allowed the, to, well, it's like the, the story does not facilitate those moments for characters. Yeah. The only other real moment that's like that. I think there are two really are when the two scientists decide to work together, which has no emotional gravity whatsoever. Um, and then the scene where Australian man and Idris Elba, you know, yeah. They they suicide bomb to distract to, to to let them complete their mission. Yes, those are the only other two times I can really think of where it like facilitates the emotion for the characters. But even those are just too they feel too tired to me. It doesn't feel earned. It doesn't feel anything. This is the closest it gets, and it and uh, yeah. So I I do think you know in terms of performance and where the character is, that's probably the only time in the movie where. We, we get that opportunity to give these characters that expressive moment. Why? Like there's just so much for characters that like we don't care about. There's so much interpersonal genre, <laughs> it, like interpersonal reaction stuff going on yeah. in this. That's the thing. We haven't had a fight since when? Since the beginning of the movie. Yes. And where are we now? Are we now an hour into the movie? Even, probably even longer. Like, Yeah, it's weird, right? And yet, for a movie that now we have gone, like, I want to say like 40 minutes or so without a giant combat. Rope. Yeah. Gil I mean, Del got- Toro has set these limitations. It's got to be stock characters. But why? Yeah, and like, I hate them. Like, you said your favorite, like, the least favorite characters. I get that you don't like the, the scientist odd couple. Right. But... Australian man, the young kid. They, they get their moments too. He's the worst. He contributes nothing to the story. You think that, like, because his father points out, it's like, you need to give that kid respect. He's the only person who's ever piloted a Jaeger by himself without dying instantly besides Idris Elba. Right. And you can't do that. Stop being a hotshot. And, like, you think, like, oh, he would start to grow and just, just like, hey, man, I'm sorry I was an asshole. And, like they become friends and their unity, which is a co- strong theme in this movie. Cause you need to be unified to drift. It's like, you're supposed to all be working together to help each other. You think that like their unity would help. And then maybe like toward the end of the movie, you would feel something, but no, he's just an asshole the entire time. Well, and then this, his Jaeger is, gets wrecked. This is a result of these arbitrary limitations with the characters. And it's yeah. not, I don't think he really did what he even set out to say. He's not using stock characters yeah. because even stock characters can be interesting and made personalized. What he is doing is he's he's conceiving of these characters on a continuum between principal character and extra, and they're just in the middle. And that is what it means when these movies, when this movie thinks of these characters as stock characters. It doesn't mean that they're really stock characters, even though they are. It's just its treatment of them is just that they are in between being really fleshed out individuals and, and non individuals. Yeah. So what it is, is it's just middle of the road. Honestly, like I think this movie could have been interesting. Like if you only had one fight in the beginning and one fight at the end. Sure. And it was like 
all about the psychological thing of preparing to like fight these things that are going to wipe out humanity. Yeah, it gives you an opportunity to really delve in more to the drift thing. But again, then you have to really go into the character thing. Yes, you exactly. Want to do that. I I think this movie could have benefited so much if the characters were a lot. Like, yeah, because like that that's the thing. It's like all the characters. There were a few that get more time than the others. It seems, but it's like they all seem to exist. We're on just, they're just barely not extras. Yeah. You know? And this is maybe a good opportunity to discuss like the thing on the commentary track, commentary track that we learned while watching it was like Del Toro's thing he discussed is like, you know, obviously I pull from a lot of different sources for reference when I'm making different movies in different genres. And really the one that I pulled from while making this movie and helped shape the structure of this movie and my conception of the characters was not really kaiju ones, but a genre that surprises a lot of people. And then he says, I watch a lot of sports movies. (sighs) Now, he does not specify which sports movies. So it's a little bit hard for me to like, there's still a genre of sports movies, right? And as with any genre, there's variants within it. Some are good, some are bad. Many are bad. But the thing is that I don't know if it's like, is it a league of their own? Is it downhill racer? Is it, what is it? Field of dreams. Like what the, is it bull Durham? Yeah. What, which one is, did you watch or did you watch the most generic ones, the Disney ones, which wind up being insulting because it's always like some sort of, you know, person from a different country who can't speak English, the blind side. It's yeah. the most patronizing shit ever. Right. And all these movies are the same. The, yeah. the blind side has been made dozens of times over by Disney. It's made like every year and they call it something else. Okay. So we're about to get the three lines of dialogue we get from the Russian, <laughs> the entire one. Right. This is like, okay. So some people would just be like, why are you question? Just let me go with this for one second. Cause it's going to be my memoriam for the two most interesting looking robots in the movie. And the sexiest couple. Am yes. I right guys? Um, Unless you count f- father and Australian boy. Yes. Um, <laughs> but or Ron Perlman in that Ron monster. Perlman and Charlie Day. Oh, um, <laughs> I ship that. And his boots. But so some people at home, if you've stayed with us this long, I'm sorry, I just saw nuns. Keep going. But they they might be just like, why? Like this isn't as this is an aesthetic like giant robots punching people movie. The color coding may not lead to anything deeper characters, but like you don't have to, that's not what kind of movie this is. You're just supposed to look at the cool Kaiju designs and the cool robot designs right. and watch that. And the characters don't necessarily matter. You get enough to understand their goals. My problem with that is that's a direction you could take this movie. I agree with you. It might not be a direction that we would appreciate more, but it's a direction you could take this movie in. My problem with that is if you want to make it about robots punching monsters and just gimmicky aesthetic, right. cool looking robots, you destroy your two most interesting looking robots in their first combat scene. They don't get time. any other combat. No, any other combat. They don't get any even time to shine. I'm okay with them getting destroyed in the first time. Oh yeah, like, they're very much extras. Yeah. Yeah. You need to explore that. And I've said this before, especially in the last fight, the underwater fight, I cannot tell Gypsy Danger and Striker Eureka apart. They are yeah. I, nearly identical looking. You save the two yeah. most homogenous, similar robots to fight homogenous, similar looking monsters. There are plenty of times where like they don't cut to the cockpit often enough. I'm like, who's doing what right now? I, right. I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And, and that's a that's a very good point. And it's a shame because they just, they dispatch them so quickly. And it just, it also feels like it's a, it feels like you you've been duped because it's like well these kaiju just kick their ass so hard and i'm supposed to believe that they were the it's like a script told me it was so but i never saw it so i don't believe it yeah. like the script tells me that they've defended hong kong port seven times they've killed seven kaiju in this thing yes but now they're about to be destroyed in i'm going to say less than a minute from now yeah and the same thing with the Russians who have never been defeated in any capacity whatsoever. They've, they've completely, by themselves, they've held the Siberian Ocean border by themselves yeah. in Cherno Alpha. Just with pure will and vodka. They've, yes. They've, they've destroyed these monsters. But now I don't, I don't believe it because, you know, these, these, one, these ones kill it so easily. Yeah, and it is a shame because this one is super cool looking. Yeah, and, like, if you're going to have, like... And they even bother to do some choreography with it. 
Yeah, and like you think the with the Hong Kong thing, like this is their territory. You think that like you might want to give them some dialogue, being like, "Oh, so we're used to defending this, so you want to do this or this." Like this area is advantageous to mount an offense, or like you don't want to go here because we've yeah, encountered this, a kaiju do this before. But no, they just go in there and die. Also, again, we're seeing like signature moves. Let's compare this to like an arcade style video game of like fighting things. Yeah, like like a final fight where it's just like I, oh, I don't know what that one it's is. It's like a beat em up, like yeah, or like Street Fighter, something like that. Okay, like, I'm not familiar with either of these, yeah. but my conception is like you have different characters with different moves. Yeah, but also. What is the point of a tag team is that you can have characters interact with one another to beat up on the same thing. You know, the other thing I'm just realizing right now is not only are these two robots dispatched almost immediately in this battle is that we at no point in the movie see two robots fighting side by side because even at the end, Gypsy Danger and uh, Australian striker Rike, they are fighting in different separate locations. That is something, you know what, like, okay, let's give props to another team-up movie here, The Avengers. Rare moment here, right? At least they have moments where... I hope our check is in the mail, Disney. Yeah, yeah, where, like, you know, Thor throws lightning off of Captain America's shield, you know, and it hits something. There are no such moments in this, you know? Like, you think there would be a moment where, like, okay, Cherno Alpha is stronger just because it's, like, it's the whatever, it's the biggest one. So, like, it, like picks up things and throws it and then like it lands on like the like as it's falling the three saw blades of the Chinese one cuts it into pieces like use the yeah use their powers collaboratively yes if this is a movie no cooperation if this is a movie about teamwork I want to see teamwork not just between pilots yeah this made my favorite shot in the movie it's great it's beautiful because again it gets back to that thing like at the beginning where there's water splashing all over the place it looks surreal and weird and cool but I mean, it, it's exactly what you're saying. And maybe somebody could make the argument that it's like, okay, well, that's part of the narrative arc of this movie is that people have to come together. But my counterpoint to that is that this fight scene is 25 minutes long. Yeah. And okay, you can make a choice. You can make a choice to have these these robots get destroyed or whatever, but it's like, but make the movie shorter. You know, if the movie is going to be this long, I want more variants and interesting things in it. Yeah. It so, can't be so homogenous. Or if you want to keep going with the theme of teamwork, You know what you should do? Kill Striker Eureka. Ah, the best one. Yeah. So that the other ones have to pick up the slack. And that also shows that like being a good pilot isn't enough. You need to learn how to get over your ego and work together as a team. Even that would be less falling into the trap of the Starship Troopers thing of like the specifically American idea of like anti-collective action. Yeah. and And you know what? It's related to the structure of sports movies. We talked about this a little bit with our killing episode, right? Yeah. And why sports movies work for like kind of metaphors for America, because it is ostensibly a egalitarian sort of like fair playing field. Right. And the idea is if you put in enough effort, right, you can beat the bad guys, you know, the other team. And all it is is how much work you put into it. Um, and in that one, it's horse racing. So it's even more direct. It's like, you, you know, they, they invest money in how well they think they can prepare for this, right? Or the jockey can, the horse on their behalf. Um, But if you're going to do the sports movie thing, then it's like, again, it's very much into that idea of not being collective, but something that's individuals. And I think that's not what Del Toro usually does. And it's weird because it results in something that it just feels like, it just feels like multinational corporate defense of the status quo yeah, like, at the end of this. And it doesn't feel like actual teaming up. It just feels like, yeah. And like, like you said, like you know, the Americans and the Australians, sure. They're different cultures, but also it's like white Western. So they're not that different. And if you, it, you, you don't even have to destroy striker Eureka. We just saw the Kaiju generate an EMP pulse or whatever and shut it down. And that's it's out of maintenance. Yeah. So have it, have it so it takes till the end of the movie to fix that. Or you know what? The other thing we talked about yesterday. What if the guy gets out of his boots and he gets knocked against the wall with a broken arm? What if they yeah. go both do it because they're Australian and they, we are going to do something really fucking stupid. Yeah. So they do that and it's fucking stupid and they both get injured. What was the other interesting idea we came up with? What if you have two talented pilots who have to pilot a different country's Jaeger? Yeah. That's a challenge. What if one pilot from a country's Jaeger dies and a different person has to? Mako is 
She is Japanese, actually. Yes. Okay. She has to do it with the U.S. with uh, with Charlie Hunnam, who yeah. is you know American, but she's just raised by Idris Elba. She does not seem like the ordinary Japanese citizen because I, like they're not even in this. The idea but, I floated out during the pre screening was uh, Cherno Alpha, like the wife who is clearly seems to be in charge of the thing. She's the one responding to the commands. The guy is always following her lead in the few scenes that they have. Also just cause that would be more interesting. Yes. Uh, but the wife dies. No, have the husband die. That's what I say. The idea I floated out yesterday was that like you have the wife die and she was in charge of everything. So the husband, despite being this like big bulky Russian looking man is now a blubbering mess and doesn't know how to work together, but he has to team up with one of the Jack or one of the Chinese people who, has been part of three brothers the entire his entire life and now has to learn to think of himself as an individual but right. also work with other people like, and now this also gives you an opportunity to take advantage of the drift more because now yeah. you you have to separate yourself from your national identity that that is the root of like vapid nostalgic thinking you know and uh that is real and that is that would take this and make it more feel like some sort of collective you know, like solidarity is happening between yeah. these different countries. And it goes back to that idea of what you're saying, where it's like, even the like UN part of this makes it feel so homogenous, you know, that it feels more fascist <laughs> this way compared to the other way. You know, if people decide to fend it for their own a little bit, it's like, you do have to bridge the gap. And then it actually, and, and then you can, I mean, it's still military industrial complex in its imagery, but you take it out of the realm of being something that feels more fascist, like Starship Troopers, and you maybe take it to that actual Japanese realm where, like, he talks about this in the commentary. He's like, the Japanese tend to have, like, a, a special relationship and interest in technology. And, you know, maybe it becomes a movie that is more interested about our relationship to technology and its way to, to, to be something that can be helpful instead of a movie that feels like it's, it's being, like, propaganda, in, in how it treats the technology, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, we, we haven't really mentioned it, but especially in the design of, of, of Gypsy well, Danger. What was this point, the point of this? Well, we talked about this, how stupid it is. I know they acknowledge, I know they acknowledge that it's stupid, but there's no lantern big enough to, 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 to make that amount of stupid okay. Where they're just like, oh, we're the only things. We need to distract it from the people. It's like, right. you, you buy your the city five seconds at most. Yes. So if it destroys your Jaeger, it destroys $10 trillion <laughs> worth of equipment that could kill it later on. Yeah. Also, assuming all the Jaegers are destroyed, how long does it take to make a Jaeger? Quite what a while. If, yeah. So what if... The it, government decided it was too expensive to keep building giant robots. So, so. it's going to kill Kong, all of Hong Kong. Yeah. And then all of all these other countries. And according to Professor Scientist, the frequency is only going to increase. increase. Yeah. So. so it seems very prudent for you not to shoot flares in its eye. <laughs> and maybe for once, don't yeah. be a glory, ho a glory hogging asshole and right. let it not destroy your Jaeger. At the same time, because it seems I appreciate how fucking Australian that is. Yeah, it's like we're oh. going to do something really fucking stupid. Yes, I agree with you. There. I love that. I love that they were just like, you know, I think an Australian would do this. And I kind of buy it, despite despite what we've just said. So, yeah. Um, the other thing we didn't mention in terms of why it really does work as a propaganda image and an image of, image of the military-industrial complex is they literally, in their conception of Gypsy Danger, he's like, I want it, Guillermo was like, I want it to look like both a World War II airplane you know, with the decals, yeah, uh, the the pinup girls and everything, but also like, I wanted to sort of move and act like John Wayne, and if that's not the most American, American yeah, but also the most conservative like idea of America, yeah, like Americana I've ever heard in my life. That <laughs> that is exactly it. Mm, rocket punch. <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting shot because one thing we didn't mention earlier. If we're going to contrast this to the prior fight with the kaiju, this is a very different approach to it. And like we said earlier, that one has a very strong focus on form. And this one also has a focus on form, but its priorities are different. And I think that rocket punch moment is an interesting example of that, where if you pay attention, where we actually cross the 180 degree line multiple times going up to that. And that's yeah. okay. You can do that. However, I think it's interesting that this fight feels 
kind of Michael Bay-ish to me yeah. in, in the way it's shot, but how it still has the priorities of setting up those like money shot porn moments yeah. with like the rocket elbow. And that's not necessarily an evaluation, just that it's interesting that visually our priorities have changed now. And this is like where I start to like, you still know what's going on because it's a one-on-one -on -one fight here, but also like it is easy to lose track of what's going on sometimes because it's kind of dark, kind of rainy, and I don't know. It's just this fight is less nicely choreographed and concise than the fight in the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And, and again, also I've stopped caring a little bit at this point because it's been going on for 80 years. Do you think it, it's a Zack Snyder thing a little bit? We're just like I'm overloaded at some point and my senses turn off. Well, also with just the sheer level of the yeah of the carnage. Oh, we get it's the not as extreme as we get that joke for the first time. Um, yes, and we're gonna get it again. We get the little about ding five minutes. Yeah. Uh, very weird moment. Yeah, that it does that. And now we have. Um, oh wait, now we have to wait for the reveal of the sword, even though it seems to be the most effective thing they have against it. Right. Well, I I do appreciate the the attempt that they discuss in the making of this where they're like, we want these Kaiju to have sort of like reveal moments. Yeah. I think, you know, alien is a good comparison. I like th where this it's like the, the monster unfolds in yes. different stages. This one has the EMP. We compared it to like a Pokemon yeah. almost. Um, Kaiju use discharge. It's super effective. Like, yeah, it makes sense. It yeah. Is, it evolved. Wait, where was the other one this whole time? Um, over I guess there. it was burning things. Yeah, it was, it was over there. Well, it's looking... It's, it was a goth kaiju, and it was, what, lighting matches because it was mm -hmm. angsty in the woods. It, it was... No, uh, or in Ron Perlman said it's... Yeah, as we learned, it's looking for Charlie Day because yeah. it's locked in on him because he drifted into the kaiju. Well, that, world. of course, is another thing, which is why does Ron Perlman know that? Well, He's a black market dealer. He knows about kaiju, but why does he a guy who understands the mechanics of how drifts work? I understand he has to give that ex exposition... And I think he does it well. I think yeah. it's well delivered. Um, I, but in movie logic, I'm going to write it away as because Idris Elba has given him exclusive rights to the Kaiju cleanup or whatnot. He, right. He has some military connection, so he probably has a general idea of how drift mechanics work. But in the fan fiction version that we wrote in our mind, we're like, yeah. it would be way cooler if the reason why he has this relationship with Idris Elba is because they used to be co-pilots. Yeah. And then we're like, you know, it would he be became better. disillusioned with the entire thing. Yes. But but then he becomes a good moral yeah. grounding point where he is the guy who's easy to judge because he is the black market guy. But also he can give you the perspective on the fact like, hey, guess what? These monsters show up. Now we're a fascist society. Yeah. This was our response to it. It was military, you know? And, and he becomes sort of like a different perspective. That could be a good option. And, and like we both said, I think we would both enjoy we would care about that psych sacrifice more at the end if it was Idris Elba and Ron Perlman. Yeah. And that's not to offend the actor who is the other guy. It's just that it is for me because <laughs> I just, I, I'm sorry. I know you were probably directed to play the unlikable asshole, but you did it so well. I hate you. Um, so yeah. I like that this, this one has chameleon eyes, by yeah. the way. Chameleon, but, chameleon eyes are in general like a wonderful like chameleons addition. are cool they are can we agree on this yes i can <laughs> this is a pro chameleon podcast i don't care who we piss off all right chameleons for the win all right then it is settled make sure you get that in the minutes oh you're a monster under fan there's a wonderful one they should add that's this giant poisonous chameleon thing but uh, uh, talking about michael bay oh uh, yeah this fight Ugh. this is again just like is this the worst fight in the movie well, you mean just this moment? I mean, they talk about it explicitly in the making of about how, like, they thought it would be funny if they did this. But I'm like, you don't even, like, the lack of awareness of how you this is satire is like. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if you do that, it has to be satire. You can't do that and not make it satire. And maybe they think it is. I don't. There's so many things in this where it's like. This just did it, Was it written as a satire? Yeah. This just reminds me of like the the SpongeBob clip where it's like <laughs> bikini bottoms on fire and everybody's running in chaos around. And it's like my we leg. Did, we did it, Patrick. We saved the city. Yeah, <laughs> it's not as bad as Man of Steel. No, because um, that also Man of Steel has the 
unfortunate side effect of being a very small person destroying giant things. Yeah. So it has this weird like slapstick quality where he <laughs> he punches a building and the whole thing explodes. It feels like a like a Buster Keaton gag, right? Yeah. It's like, oops, didn't mean to do that. I guess nine thousand people just died. Thanks, Superman. Doot, doot, doot. But anyway, like it still kind of feels that way. Superman is another franchise along with Fantastic Four. I think you could do a new interesting movie with it if you did like retro 60s aesthetic. Oh, and here's ran that, with that. M- move again. It's the same gag. Joke, yeah. Hey, five minutes later. Do we really need it again? <laughs> but Max, uh, it's J.J. Abrams character is named after Isaac Newton, but also Newt from Aliens, which is why he says, call me Newt. And then on the soundtrack, there's a song called Call Me Newt. Did you know that? Yeah, I think it adds a lot to the movie that we have that detail. I'm glad. I'm glad you think that. Do you know the kaiju come out at night, mostly? But that's only because it makes it easier for the <laughs> CG to work. Yes. Okay, so now it can... Take sh- your fucking tongue. It can shoot acid. This one is like... Honestly, I prefer this fight yeah. more to to the uh, gorilla one, gorilla boy. Yeah. Um, Although I do like that gorilla boy is just like a he's a big he's what you know what he's show he's like on that cat chart of the chonk chart. <laughs> he's like on the far end. He's like the part where it's like, oh lord, he coming. That's what he is. <laughs> it's sad that I know what you're talking about. No, it's great. I, I showed that to my coworker Marsha last yeah. week, and she loved it. But um. <laughs> This kaiju is the most like I, I like know, this one. I know, but this it has cool. It has so many powers. It it it, it, it does has have a it, lot. It has the claw tail, which is deadly effective. Oh, here's a good. It porn has the shot, acid by the way. spit. Porn. There yes. you go. It can fly, and also we find out later it's pregnant. Everything. This but is, also the fact that it's pregnant makes no sense. Is it an animal or is it a bioengineered? See monster. My my mo- my in the world of this movie logic kicks in and it's just like okay, pregnant. They're using it to explain that. I like, really like these shots. Yeah, that I don't know how it flies without its tail, but whatever. Anyway, um, it looks but like great. it's uh, I I like to think of it as just like okay, so this kaiju was like made to have another one ready inside of it, so it like could continue the invasion or sure. whatnot, but. Pregnant is just the term that we use to describe. I don't it. know if I'm a monster. I <laughs> sword <feel> like... button. <laughs> <laughs> I need a sword button in my car. I have that on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> but again, details are cool. Yeah, visually it's cool. But again, this is the moment she gets revenge. This is the other thing that we didn't mention about the drift stuff and the potential of it with with Mako, where it's like this is the moment she gets revenge, but she has no relationship with this kaiju. Yeah. It's just a, it's a non-specific monster entity. Why is that the one she gets revenge with? It unless would, they're all just, it would make and more sense. If, yeah. It would make more sense for her. If she said that, like at the end when they blow up the thing and this she stops the, the attacks at all, this is the benefit of making it an actual kaiju movie is because when the monsters have personality, then you can also have real antagonist monsters. Yes. Maybe that's a little bit sillier than this in some ways, but we're already at the point where it's a movie about giant robots. Yes. So I don't know. Um, but also we were talking about the stuff with the drift. Like if you are going to co- synthesize the, oh, this might be a reference to this being a sports movie, by the way, the fact that they land in the stadium. Touchdown. Goal! Thank you for that. Anyway, that's how soccer announcers sound, right? Yes, exactly. Anyway, um, but yeah, if you are going to synthesize like the internal, emotional, surreal struggle that happens in the drift and then also the physical battle, we were talking like it would be really cool since the kaiju we know apparently can drift. What if they had some sort of telepathic ability that like they could engage and fuck with your mind, you know, while you're fighting them? And we were talking about it, it's like if you have that that be a possibility with the kaiju, then you can actually stage a scene in which Mako ostensibly has to fight the kaiju not in the real world as much but in her own mind and it's like the kaiju can actually engage with her emotions and antagonize her the kaiju could become the kaiju the same kaiju that is like the one that destroyed her family that she's running from make a kaiju because like we just saw it developed a emp weapon yes they're adapting so make one that can or because like have it more consequential that charlie day drifted with the kaiju right they learn their pilots. They learn stuff about them. 
and yes. they realize that like, oh, if we send the same one, it's going to fuck with this pilot and they're going to yes. be less effective. Of course, in order for that to happen, you have to first view the kaiju as more than just bugs. Yeah. Which this movie doesn't do. Even though it explains that they're more than just... Uh, it's, yeah. Y- yeah, it's weird. Um, but it's like, it, it, it's riding the line in a way that just makes it Starship Troopers. Yay, you know? we lost half of our mechs and half of our pilots. Welcome to the Roughnecks, sir! <laughs> No, oh. I would expect any man to do the same for me and shoot me in the fucking face if anything happens. God forbid I live in a wheelchair. Fascism. It feels like fascism. Uh, and that's the other weird thing, too, that we talked about yesterday where it's like, okay, in the two movies of Del Toro's that we have covered yes. on this show, you know, maybe I am missing something. I will admit this. It's always a possibility, Max. And maybe we'll revisit this movie again at some point. I'll be like, I was totally wrong. Have we covered two of Del Toro's movies on this show? Yes, this and Hellboy. Oh, I thought you were talking about besides this. Okay. Oh, no. Um, but, like, the th- the thing is, like, okay, in the other movie, there's there's also a notable figure who is made of gears and clockwork. Of course, he's filled with sand and he's hollow. Yes. And he's a Nazi, right? He's a fascist. He's a clockwork soldier. We talked about in that commentary why that's such a good image because he's he has no internal soul or interiority. He's just a system of instructions and rules, like a like a fascist like arithmetic and regulation and law, right? That's why that clockwork works as an image. And yet the Jaegers are also clockwork figures, right? Only this time we're now inside them. They're technically a more complex variation of that image. Yeah. So they're so well prepared to examine this in terms of satire. But again, it just doesn't go there. Okay. Also, a dumb little nitpicky thing. Okay. Um, so the kaiju are genetically engineered by this conqueror race in order to kill the life on planet so that they can get there. So they're artificial beings, right? Why, are they, why do they have skin lice? I don't know. Maybe, I know. maybe it's a part of their development. Maybe it's part of like the fact... I guess part of the problem is like we don't technically need this information. Yeah. But in lieu of structure, it leaves you space to wonder and ask. But I guess I just assume that it was like uh, some sort of that some sort of like the same way that the Jaegers have to have. I don't know certain things that may, like obviously humans can't breathe in water, yeah. right? So we need certain things to regulate the environment. You know, in, in in the same way, maybe kaiju, because this planet is not entirely terraformed for them yet, like maybe the skin lice help regulate some sort of biological thing that happens to them if they're out in the open air for too long, you know? <laughs> Why would you do that? You're going to find out anyway. These guys look so ugly in their trash bag outfits. Not what I want to be wearing on a Saturday night. You feel me, Max? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know what kind of clubs you go to, but you can <laughs> find some crazy stuff like that. <laughs> the clubs with the people in the hazmat yeah. suits where people try to dance, but they just fall over. Don't kink shame me. <laughs> kink shame? I, dancing has nothing to do with the kink, Max. Yeah. Oh, innocent sweet Austin. But it's pregnant, um, which serves no purpose other than... Then what? Gendering the monster says feminine sort of i don't even know like i mean pregnancy is all i mean so often wrapped up with monstrosity godzilla's gender has changed occasionally um but like it doesn't there are gendered monsters like king Ghidorah is gendered masculine mothra is always gendered female Um, right but also i feel like it's also a different question with kaiju because they do seem more like characters yeah where you know often in horror movies something that critics will discuss is ideas of like the ways in which horror movies code antagonists as others in many different ways. And, you know, you can read many horror movies as being potentially problematic in that sense, where we, we stage an encounter with the antagonistic other. And then we, again, through the dialectical progression, learn, we, we confront them, we learn about them, and then we, we dispel the danger, you know? Okay. So this scene, so what was the point of it? Why did the kaiju need to be pregnant? Why couldn't they just find the secondary brain in the kaiju that was already killed? Um, because we have to hang out with JJ. 
Is that literally the only reason you don't like this character? Is you no, I explained it. I mean, I think structurally this character needs to be like Dr. Strangelove or, you know, Neil Patrick Harris. Yeah. But I am distracted by the fact that it's J.J. And it makes me confused. And the fact that he gets licked by like a vagina mouth tongue is like, what's up with that? Well, we know J.J. likes that. Yeah. Oh, and then he gets eaten. And I, I respect the decision to give, you know, Ron Perlman the dramatic death and out the way you want to do with your good actors in this movie. But it's like... But he doesn't die, as we learn from this movie's end credits. <laughs> well, not only that, but it's like, again, what are we doing? We're taking up time in the movie. We are also getting rid of a more interesting character than the character that is there. So, I don't know. Don't know how I feel about it. He doesn't even have the good sense to wear his shoe. But as we discussed yesterday, if he did survive, that essentially sets him up with the same character arc of Mako because he gets out and he's like, who has my shoe? Yes. And it's literally the same narrative repeating itself. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, ostensibly hinting that the sequel will be him getting over the trauma of being eaten. Or in the Jaeger the, and getting his shoe from Idris Elba, the, the trauma who was also alive somehow. The, the trauma of him losing his shoe. <laughs> he cares more about the shoe than even being eaten. Yes. It's the real thing. But why wouldn't you? I mean, that shoe looked nice, looked expensive. Okay, so he has super radiation cancer because he was piloting. Is this a cross image between that pool and the window? We know Del Toro does like Christ. Yeah, things. it could be, honestly. But again, this Especially is just... Especially since Idris Elba's... Like, it, these characters could both be considered saviors, um, so why not? But definitely Idris Elba because it's the suffering yeah. for everyone else thing. Except it, it is comparable to... Um, oh my God, how am I forgetting this, this man's name? Scanners and Starship Troopers and Total Recall. Michael Ironside. Yes. It is comparable to Michael Ironside where it views, you know, his his suffering, his bodily suffering as a result of his military service as heroic sacrifice, as valor, right? But what it really, and Star Wars, Starship Troopers obviously has an awareness of this. In that movie, it is clear that it, it makes you feel gross about the movie giving him that valor moment because it's like, no, this is just him being exploited, <laughs> You know? Yeah. And it's the same thing with Idris Elba. That's really what it is. It's not a heroic sacrifice. It is, oh shit, they didn't put radiation, you know, like shielding in this. I guess they cheaped out, didn't they? Yeah. Did they pay for health care? Oh no, I guess we're in the private system. Well, so, no, no, so you gave them the yellow pills. The yellow don't die of cancer right now pills. But he only has 10 of them. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. We're going to up the price. Better get ready. <laughs> or or he he dies not because of that but because he does have private health care aside from that and he gets he has to take it in like insulin he's like i can't yeah. afford it anymore spend all my money on the yellow pills oh and now they truly are the odd couple i hate this oh leave them alone they're cute. never they're cute together never I, I i'll go to their wedding i would enjoy it the only interesting moment of this scene is when he turns and looks J.J. Abrams in the eye and says, you have to share the neural load. And he says it just like that. And, uh, and it just pushes in on both of them slowly for a solid two seconds. And then they grab hands and they flex and they say... The cancer-ridden old man, <laughs> of course. Right. But also, oh, who cares? I was going to say, isn't the whole plot point that Gypsy Danger is the only one with a nuclear reactor? Yeah, but I think... So if he gets in one that doesn't have one, is it a problem? I'm sure it explained itself. Well, no. So Gypsy Danger is the only one with a nuclear reactor. It doesn't matter anymore because all of them have radiation shielding at this point. But... I think it's supposed to be the mental load of it would kill him. Yes. But then it is, it does, what does it have to do with the radiation at all? It, the radiation was the reason he's sick in the first place, but at this point he's so, just... So, okay, so they're not specifically related, but the radiation does make it harder for him to drift. Yeah. Okay. 
but apparently he's also a master at drifting. Yes, because he brings nothing with him into the drift. No memories, no conflicts. Because what the fuck does that mean? So mean- you just eliminate all the drama. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. It means I didn't. They didn't write a backstory for me, so there's no drama I could bring into the drift. They canceled his backstory. <laughs> oh God. But I think the main character of the second movie is his kid. Okay. But but he doesn't have a kid. Mako yeah, is his kid. Yeah. It's almost like they couldn't get anybody to return for. The what movie. if they went really weird and it was the bulldog? Yeah, the bull. That'd be great. What if the bulldog, uh, the bulldog, is like a key a secret kaiju spy? <laughs> <laughs> they just push in on, and it has like the like the bird box, like monster eyes. Yeah, <laughs> it's been taken over. Oh man, that'd be excellent. This movie just needs a little bit more. Su- like I know it sounds weird, but like it needs a little more goofy shit. Not not stupid. I mean, that's a way you could take it. Not stupid, but goofy. Just like add a little flavor and fun. awareness. Yeah, awareness. And I it, weirdly, Del Toro's strength as a, as a filmmaker is not necessarily satire, but it is his strength is very much something that is bound up in his sincerity and his commitment to character. And I feel like that actually works against the structure of this movie. I feel like this movie drags because we are too committed to our scientist characters who are just scientists and really should be no more than extras, but they become, they take up like 25 minutes in the movie to give them their little arc. We are too committed, like in your opinion, to the Australian characters. Yes. But also not committed to them enough to make them interesting. Yeah. This movie, it's weird. It could be great. It is weird. Yeah. It's very bizarre. Yeah. And again, just to just to bring up like the weirdness that we mentioned earlier of his radiation stuff and the absence of Japan. So he he got his radiation stuff after the thing in Japan, which is also where he got Mako, that battle, yeah. right? But also Japan is absent from this. So what? What is the context of that? Is Japan just completely destroyed because it's I don't in the middle know. of the ocean? Like- but also what are like the subtextual implications? Like, okay, so now we have this entire thing where like Russia, China, the U.S., are teaming up on Japan, but also we're about to, by the way, Kaiju, like we said, are an institution of Japanese culture. Yes. And you know how we're going to destroy them is we're going to go through the portal and we're going to explode a nuclear reactor on them. <laughs> so what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, I don't, I, I mean, none of that is clearly intentional, but it's kind of strange. I, the absence of Japan from this movie is conspicuous. I do love that they give them the opportunity to say goodbye to the dog, though. I wonder, like, okay, so this is weird, but, like, from what I understand, uh, Crimson Typhoon, the setting of Hong Kong and a lot of it, like, a lot of it was used to try to sell the movie in China. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, And to this day, China and Japan do not have the greatest political relations. Um, China and Hong Kong don't have the greatest of political relations. Yes. And that's something that's weirdly tense in this movie. It's... Flashes, flashes. But yeah. aside from the fact that it's set there and the fact that Hong Kong, I am not an economist, by the way, but Hong Kong is like, it is known for being an extremely open, unregulated free market, right? And what... A lot of which was done out of spite, but... <laughs> but well, here's the thing. It is also very important and has been very important for like global trade flows, right? Yeah. Internationally. And... It makes sense to set it here because it's almost like a point of access for like the West and the you know U.S. commodities into China almost. But also, if we're talking about this being a UN thing and a homogenous one-world nation that is kind of fascist, and we compare that to the idea of like totalitarian capitalism, it is weird that it also takes place in Hong Kong, which is like sort of culturally this image of unregulated economy and something that is important to global trade and not to get too like pretentiously Marxist about it, but it becomes this fascistic propaganda thing because it's almost like subtextually it's in Hong Kong because they are defending global capital from these monsters. Well, it's not even just capital. It's more like, um, I would say just like it's intertwining capitalism with global collect uh, connectedness <laughs> to a degree. Yeah. But it, it feels fascist. 
I think that's just yeah. the military aspect of it. Um, and he go in the weirdest thing in the commentary is when he talks specifically about like, well, you can't make it like that because then that'd be fascist. And yeah. like, what, what did I miss? You know, what am I missing? Cause you agree with me that it'd be fascist. So like, I don't like, and by the way, when we say this movie is fascist, please understand the context in which... Okay, I'm going to leave that with you because I'm not completely on board with the term fascist for this movie. Um, well, Charlie Day is. We're going to see that in about two seconds, yes. aren't we? So again, was this written as a satire? I don't know. But when I say fascist, I will take responsibility for this. I would say, think of that in comparison to the way that Starship Troopers works. And also think of that in comparison to the degree of respect and interest that that Guillermo del Toro always seems to take when engaging with the antagonistic monstrous other in his other films. That is something that is a bedrock. That is part of the, that is like one of the things that makes him an auteur fundamentally. And, uh, it does not happen in this movie. And the contrast between those two separate things makes this feel, feel so, limited in its ability to actually engage with anything other than it, its own ideology, which again is the status quo. Uh, and again, that's the other weird propaganda E thing about it. You were talking about like Kaiju movies. Part of what defines them as Kaiju movies is our relationship with the monster. And also like the, the monster having some sort of personality. We know Kaiju have agency because they do not always want to destroy us yeah. or sometimes they destroy us, but then they decide to stop. Yes. They're not soldiers. They're not bugs. And in some rare occasions they're protecting us from a different threat. Like yes. Or sometimes they're destroying us, but they hate a different Kaiju more. So they pause and they're like, get the fuck out of here. I'm destroying the city. Yeah. You know, they have agency as characters and, uh, Part of the interesting thing in that is because they have such great designs and because they do have character traits, like you said earlier, way back at the start of this movie, when you're watching those kaiju movies, they have the ability to, in the marketing and everything else, take on the role of being a mass... Yeah. What is that? Movie fascist? Yeah. I don't know. But like, when kaiju have that, because they have those qualities, they have the ability to take on the role of being a mascot for the movie. And what is the mascot for this movie? It's not a kaiju. It's gypsy danger. Yeah. And that's, that feels like the propaganda thing to me. It's like, you don't, I, the other is not the celebrated mascot of this movie. It's the giant suit that you get in to punch it. So very weird movie. And I'm sure there's a possibility we're missing something, but I don't know. That holographic imaging thing looks like the most impractical thing in the history of existence oh i it you know i i i accidentally double tapped it so now it's locked on scaling so every time i move it it just gets super big <laughs> right do you ever do that with like yeah. different things on your phone yeah or you just accidentally zoom in too much or... you know like oh god how do i do this <laughs> he does it too much and it gets it's the entire room oh god i'm <laughs> sorry guys i can't see anything and it's messing up the color scheme So oh, here we get the big category five kaiju, which definitely should have been a kaiju that we had fought already or something. Or like, you know, looks really distinct and not kind of like every other four legged kaiju. Something that has we a saw. Yeah. personality. I mean, they look cool, I guess. This looks cool. It just, it looks similar to the other ones. And I also can't really see where it is. Like none of these kaiju got reveal shots because yeah. they just came out underwater. So I don't and know. And because we're two hours deep into this movie now. Yeah, like I don't know where anything is or what's going on or what they're fighting. Like, I mean, I here's the thing. I can see how this is storyboarded in my mind and I'm like, this is cool. Because I know we we have talked about doing this show this movie on the show a lot, by the way. But we we've been thinking about doing uh Mario Bava's Planet of the Vampires. Yes. And this this subterranean sort of like ocean floor lighting is like this is lit exactly like Planet of the Vampires and it looks cool. And I like the idea of them fighting here conceptually, but also like it just, it, I don't know. It just, it just, just cut kind of off looked, its head. Don't try to be fancy and burn it in a fucking volcanic vent. I don't know. I guess I don't hold that against them no. because I like the idea of do like taking advantage of the environment in the fight. I, I think do. that's creative. And also I, I, 
I have no confidence in my own ability to pilot a giant robot and fight a monster. So I can't judge them for not necessarily going for the killing, the decapitation immediately. Eat it. And you stupid where, monster. So they're fighting both the category fours right now. Fine. Where's the category five? Is it still just hanging it's out? It's just hanging out. It's hanging out by Strike Eureka doing nothing for no it's reason? F5. Strike, contact. I, I think that Striker Re- Eureka's Helen greatest Hunt. power is to get disabled and then distract the other monster for a long period of time. You know, even the movie Twister kind of does it better than than this one, which is horrifying to say because in Twister, a category, an F five tornado kills like Helen Hunt's, like, or is it Helen Hunt? I've never. Seen I always Twister. confuse her with Holly Hunter. I'm sorry. No, it's Helen Hunt, but she's in Twister. And a F5 tornado kills her parents or whatever at the beginning. And then at the end, like, there's an F5 again, and it almost kills her and Bill Paxton because it's like we have to go back to the beginning. But there's almost a moment with, like, Philip Seymour Hoffman where he's like, this could be an F5 tornado. It's back. You know, it's like the same one. And it's like after her is this weird implication. It's- but that makes more story logic sense kind of than than it being a random one, even though it makes less sense in that context. Than what? Here. No, it's a tornado. <laughs> I know, but I'm saying emotionally. I'm saying it would obviously work better here. It's an emotional tornado. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> People know what I mean. So here's a weird question. If they get hurt, can they, they only limp now in the thing? I think so. That's the point. So they can't pick up their foot normally and just have the thing limp. They have to limp. I Not that it so. matters. It doesn't matter. Because like they do feel pain when the robot gets damaged. We've seen right, that. right. So like it might just be so you can more accurately pilot it. Like it adapts to like the damage done to the thing. So it's like oh, I can't really move this arm anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. It's I hard. mean, technically, that's the way your brain controls your own body. Yeah, it's the only reason you feel pain. Your foot got cut off? Oh, fuck. Don't step on it. Yeah. Because that is not going to work. Do you have a favorite kaiju design from this movie? I told you. Um, the first one. The knife oh, head. yeah, that's right. The knife head one. I think we both agree on that. Yeah. I, I like knife head. That's definitely my favorite fight. That's the one where the design works the best in the environment. Yeah. I well, mean, the chameleon one. I, yeah. Has, I, has that one cool. is called Otachi. Yes. I learned. So Otachi, I like Otachi and it is the weakest of the ones I like, but I also kind of like the hammerhead one. Is it called this one? Is it called hammerhead? I bet it's called hammerhead. Um, it, it probably is, but, uh, I think that one's cool as well. I think the weirdly enough, I think the F five one is the, you know, I, that one is just kind of the same to me. Yeah. Um, one second. I wanted to check something. Oh, yeah. So again, nuclear bomb. Oh yeah. So they they blow up the they blow up the bomb they were going to use to blow up the breach. Oh my God! Wait a to second. To kill both the kaiju. I know this means nothing but they blow up two nuclear bombs to destroy the Japanese cultural institution. Oh, God. <laughs> it's weird. It means nothing. Yeah. But it, the fact that they do use one is weird. It's just con- Well, they confusing. use two, technically. Yeah, I know. I, I, there's no reason that, for it to be that, though. There's nothing... There's no way in which the subtext of this movie is restaging like the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima through destroying these kaiju this way. But like, cause that would be a real fucking stretch, but also like, it's kind of weird. It, the, it's not necessarily weird on the own, but the, on its own, but the absence of Japan as a national entity here makes it bizarre. Yeah. I wonder why they did that. I wonder if there's some sort of behind the scenes thing where he explained. Maybe we are. Is it possible we're just fucking missing something with like the world building? Did Japan get destroyed entirely? I mean, it would make sense 
because it's an island nation, like in that ocean. <laughs> so like, yeah, I would understand it, but I wish they had addressed it. But even that is like, it's weird because it's also like, well, Japan invented the, the mech. Like for Japan to have no representation here yeah, at all. Is at just... the very least early on, be like, oh, um, Well, because I think they say a guy invited it after watching his son play with toys or something. So, but like, have that be a Japanese guy. Do something with that. Okay, and we're in the weird alternate dimension now. Ah, uh, yes. How do you think about the way this looks? I mean. It makes sense because it's kind of drifty and it's nice, um, but in general, it looks kind of just generic sci-fi type stuff. Kind of. I do appreciate the weird, like, it looks like they do some sort of, like, I, I, like a like a shifting of different, like, like, color values to make it look kind of like the way it looks when you take 3D glasses off a little bit. Yeah. Not so much that it's annoying, but... I appreciate that just as a little visual touch because that is something that you really don't see. Where like it is almost alienating to 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 look at, but but I I think that works with this. Okay, so we have him jettisoning her out of the breach, even though. Now is it going to open back up? Yeah, without the, the kaiju. Barcode, yeah. <laughs> Can anything get out of there? I don't know. I mean, it does. I mean, that's that's pedantic at this yeah, point. That is pedantic, but yeah. also, again, end of a two-hour movie about fighting robots um, and without as much substance as you'd want. And again, like you mentioned earlier, to people who like, oh, this is a fighting robot movie, what do you expect? That is the argument that lazy people make when they know they have made a bad movie. <laughs> the phrase popcorn movie, I, when is that phrase used except by producers who want to excuse the lapses of logic in, in what they've just created. And there are good movies, which I would consider popcorn movies, but like, and I think good movies that would like consider themselves popcorn movies. Yeah. But also they don't use that as an excuse to be lazy, you know? And the weird thing is I wouldn't even say this movie is lazy. No, I would just say that it is misguided. Like I said, if I have, but it's an excuse. If I have to watch this or, Every, the, the bajillion Transformers movies. I'll watch this every time because there are artistic flourishes. There are cool ideas. There are cool designs. I just kind of wish it was sewn together in a more conducive package. That's my general thoughts on it. I mean, we're basically at the end of the movie now. These weird bug things. They're literally bugs are about to get blown up by gypsy danger because the reactor exploded whatever well max uh one other thing i was curious in discussing before this movie ends is about the mako character and people have responded to her characters for a reason that makes sense to me um where they talk about it in fact she has spawned i'm sure you're aware a whole new internet test for female characters test thing called the mako test obviously yeah um where they talk about her having her own character arc separate from the males that is completed in the film and is conceived of on her own terms that has nothing to do with romance and then does not get wrapped up in romance at any point in the movie. Which is good. But also, like, I think it is sort of to go back to that Anna Biller article that we reference so frequently, like people ha seem to have again conflated that with an idea of like feminism which is like that's like a that's like using the Bechdel test to say if a movie's feminist it should be the bare minimum it but also people forget that the Bechdel test started as satire yeah of like movies are so sexist here's this joke you know like but here's the other thing is like to get back to that Anna Biller article is like this is the result of basement level expectations with these characters yeah. so that when we see a character that is dynamic in and to any degree, it is like, well, let's name an internet test. And I'm not, this is not me trying to shit on the character. 
But let me ask you, like, now that we've established the term dynamic character, you know, a character that changes on her own terms, do you actually think Mako is a strong character? Um, I think she's the strongest character in this movie. I agree. Um, but is she a strong character? You know what? I'm going to fall just over the finish line on yes, but I think that might be escalated by the fact that nobody else in this movie is really a character. Yes. Um, and I, I think I'm sort of there with you where it's like, I understand that she is a dynamic character and absolutely there's value in that. And there's value in recognizing the way in which women are not dynamic characters. This is historically why supporting act, female actor nominations are routinely just better than, yeah. than lead because historically it's like, Oh, they're always written more interestingly in supporting roles, aren't they? And the leading ones just kind of like, yeah, you, you know? So like when you have this opportunity in this movie and they do take the, the pains to set her up in that specific way, it, it is worth celebrating and recognizing, but let's also be real. Is her, is her narrative arc really, so different from many other revenge arcs that you've seen in similar movies. Is there anything specific? Does it innovate in that way? Does it try something really new? Does it have insane emotional gravity to it? Not really. In she's context, a very simple character. In the to- context of this movie, yes, but that's because she's a character. Because of- she's surrounded by the weaker ones. Yes. And it's like... Which honestly, like... That's, that's, if, that's we're okay. gonna, if we're going to inverse that... That happens in a lot of other movies where the male protagonist is the only character. Really. And they're also boring. And yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely worth celebrating, but yeah. also it's like, and you like know, I said, I, I like her in this movie. The actress is good. She's the only one with an arc that she works towards. She's an effective character. Yeah. Like good. But that was Pacific Rim by Guillermo del Toro. Well, um, I'm not finished talking about that. I'm just saying like the thing about that character that is like worth, that's interesting to me is like, oh, she's very familiar. And I don't know how much actual innovation is going on there other than just executing on it being a dynamic, independent character, which is, again, worth recognizing and celebrating, but within the context that it happens. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Again, something that could have been maybe made more specific and interesting with, it, it, with like, because I think... I like think, you said, the Bechdel test was made a satire. Yeah. The fact that we need to celebrate that all is annoying, like just because the fact that it's so like Hollywood is so shallow that like right. that's something to be celebrated, but at the time that's where we're at right now. So it yeah. is what it is. Uh, don't lose sight of I guess what's important with characters is actually just treating we them should, like people. Okay, that's good to celebrate. We should keep moving forward. That yes. shouldn't be the standard. <laughs> it should be the bare minimum. We yes. should need to keep moving forward. And and nor should scripts be written as a series of plug-in number tests yeah because that doesn't necessarily make sense either so at any rate this has now been pacific atlantic rim yes <laughs> no the day that we get to an asylum picture movie is the day i'm leaving this podcast <laughs> but but yes so uh do you have any final words on the movie max um not one of del toro's best for my final thoughts but a uh, Mid, like, but aside from the fight scenes, I would say it is a visually interesting, slightly misguided fan film with good aesthetics, a good character, and, and I would, some solid performances. Solid performances yeah. and good intentions. I would say, yeah. I, um, Certainly I don't, not the worst movie. I don't find this movie cynical. I don't find it bad in any way. Most of my complaints for this, I just see how it could have gone from pretty good to a great movie, a, a Guillermo del Toro movie, yeah, mainly something um, really memorable. Yes, yes, and I think that's a that's a possibility with every time he he picks up a camera, right? Um, so to see it be something like this is a little bit of a disappointment. Um, however, I you know, oh God, we're gonna get this. The after this credit scene. scene. You know, I'm turning this off. We can't watch this. Wait, this is want, not part of the movie. You don't want to see Ron Perlman say, where's I my have not goddamn seen shoe? I have not seen it yet, and I'm not watching it today. Sorry. I don't know why I'm taking my stand there. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah. So, people know how I feel about this movie. Um, I'm sure it sounds like I ragged on it the entire time, but I think it's, I think it's a fine 
movie. I just, I don't, I'm not like a big fan of it and I don't feel like a lot of need to revisit it. I think he fell into the trap of obsessing over the minutia and, um, you know, it's just a little bit misguided, but certainly there's still lots of interesting things to discuss and digest and go over. I don't think I'll watch this movie by myself again. It's the kind of movie I, I definitely watch with friends if they feel like watching it again. I wouldn't be against it if right. somebody suggested it, but like you said, yeah, I think I'm good with this movie for now. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen the sequel because I heard one Del Toro wasn't involved with it and two it was just supposed to be dog shit. It's like how dumb this movie could that have been. That one, I don't know if this is going to make sense, but that one looked like 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 the Fast and the Furious in yeah. the Rim, in the Pacific Rim. No, it's Fast like Fast and Furious. Yeah, it's like what would happen if you gave the first one to Michael Bay rather but than But without Del Toro. the Rock flexing and breaking out of a cast. Which is vital. Well, you're the only two characters that carry over are your two favorite characters, Charlie Day and Professor Scientist. So I'm gonna walk <laughs> into the ocean. But yeah. This has been the Spectator Film Podcast. If you'd like to hear me complain more about JJ Abrams being a scientist, maybe there's some other movie where he does that. Uh, you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. <laughs> what kind of fucking <laughs> ending is that? Leave me alone. Uh, you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com and we have episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. And yes, I have nothing else to say. So the episode is over. Goodbye. Goodbye.